Now, a hearing on cancer treatment for women. The House Government Reform Committee today heard from cancer survivors, doctors, and health professionals. Representative Dan Burton chairs this four-hour hearing. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. Uh, we will have other members, uh, I see some of them coming in right now, uh, joining us, so uh, they'll be coming in just a few moments. <clears throat> We're here today to talk about a subject that has probably touched every family in America, cancer. And specifically today, we're going to talk about women's cancers. At uh, hearings in the future, we will be talking about some of the major concerns that men have, prostate cancer. I have uh, uh, talked to Michael Milken's staff. Uh, we're going to be talking to Senator Dole's staff. We'll be talking to the minority also about people that they might want to have testify about uh, men's problems, prostate cancer, and, and other issues, as well as diets uh, that, uh, that might uh, assist uh, uh, men in fighting this, uh, this dread disease as well. But today we're going to be talking about women's cancers. In this country, every 64 minutes, a woman is diagnosed with a reproductive tract cancer. One in eight women today will get breast cancer. One in eight. It's an absolute epidemic. And uh, some people believe that that uh, figure will grow to as many as one in three or four. Some say that that number will get even worse, as I said. This is turning out to be a very busy week in Washington for cancer issues. Last Sunday, over 60,000 people participated in the National Race for the Cure, sponsored by the Susan B. Coleman Breast Cancer, cancer Foundation. This foundation has done a phenomenal job raising awareness of breast cancer and raising money for research and treatment, and I applaud their work as well as my colleagues do as well. Today, the Government Reform Committee will receive testimony from researchers, health care providers, and patients on the role of early detection and complementary and alternative health practices in women's cancers. This coming weekend, the Center for Mind, Body, Medicine, and the University of Texas Houston Medical School, in cooperation with the National Cancer Institute and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, is conducting the second annual comprehensive can cancer conference. They will bring together researchers, practitioners, and patients to discuss research advances and patient needs in both conventional and alternative medicine. This week, this same week, 1,355 women in America will lose their lives to one of these cancers. Overall, more than 10,000 men, women, and children will die from cancer in America this week. 10,000. We say to their family and loved ones, we in Congress recognize that the war on cancer declared by President Richard Nixon in 1971 is far from over. We cannot, after 28 years and tens of billions of dollars in research, declare victory because we're not close yet. My wife suffered from breast cancer several years ago. Thankfully, she's a five-year survivor. Last year, I lost my mother and my stepfather to lung cancer. So I know, as well as many of my colleagues know, what families go through when loved ones have to fight cancer. Every additional year a patient lives is a victory. Every new treatment, drug, or surgical technique is a potential victory. However, we have not won this war on cancer, but we will not give up. The committee has been working to break through barriers of institutional bias, to get more research done in complementary and alternative therapies for cancer, and to improve the information available to the public from the federal government on treatment options. We cannot abide by institutional biases within the government that says something is not acceptable because it is alternative or unconventional. We must ensure that there is a balance between genetics, drug development, natural product development, and alternative therapy research within the National Cancer Institute. 
To combat this bias, I am introducing the, quote, Inclusion of Alternative Approaches in Cancer Research Act, end quote. This bill, my bill, would ensure that every advisory group of the National Cancer Institute would have at least one member who is an expert in complementary and alternative medicine. One leading drug treatment for breast cancer and ovarian cancer, Taxol, was originally derived from the yew tree and was developed through the Natural Products Program. It is important to continue to look to nature for other opportunities for drug development. It would be a shame if reductions in funding for the Natural Product Drug Program resulted in missing the next Taxol that might save lives. I have previously mentioned that less than 1% of the National Cancer Institute's $2.7 billion annual budget goes to research in complementary and alternative medicine. That is very disappointing. Unfortunately, the director of that institute does not see the need to change that ratio and told me in December that he has no plans to extend that, even though half of America's cancer patients will include a complementary or alternative treatment in their plan to fight cancer. And I believe that since we're giving them $2.7 billion, 1% is not enough, and we will do everything in our power to make sure that more of those funds are given to alternative and complementary <coughs> research. Taxol, tamoxifen, and other drugs are important tools in the fight against cancer. So are pap smears and mammograms, and so is an integrated treatment plan. We have been pleased with the assistance we have received from several of the professional medical associations involved in these areas, including the Society for Gynecological Oncology and the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. Dr. Edward Trimble will present information on the National Cancer Institute's research in early detection and the integration of complementary and alternative health practices in women's cancers. Cancer is a disease, but its victims are heroes and heroines, they are people, real people with families, jobs, and communities. They make a difference in our lives. People like Sally McLean from Indianapolis, Indiana, who lost her life to breast cancer that metastasized to her spine. Sally was a friend of Claudia Keller on my staff. She also was the daughter of a man who taught me in high school who was a good friend of mine. And it's a shame that one so young should, should die so young because of a disease like this. But Sally didn't give up the fight not one single day. Or Lloyd, or Lynn Lloyd, a high school English teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland. After two bouts with breast cancer, she's now hospitalized with cancer in her brain and her lungs. Even when she was receiving chemotherapy last year, she scheduled it around her classes so she could keep teaching and stay involved with her students. Now that's real dedication. Most of her students didn't even realize that she was battling cancer until her most recent hospitalization. We're honored today to have another one of those heroines with us, a lady that's a very, very good friend of mine. She and her husband uh, were, uh, her husband and I were elected to Congress together back in, eight, in 1982. And uh, we're gonna miss him in the United States Senate, uh, Congress, or Senator Mack. But his lovely wife, Miss Priscilla Mack, is the executive co-chair of the National Race for the Cure. As a breast cancer survivor, she knows from personal experience the importance of early detection. She has worked hard to raise awareness about women's cancer issues. With the energy that Ms. Mack brings to this fight, we will hopefully begin winning more of these battles, saving more lives, getting research funded that will get to answers about prevention, early diagnosis, treatment, and hopefully one day very, very soon a cure. Biomedical research already knows that there is not a magic bullet cure for cancer. What we do know at this time is that the earlier cancer is diagnosed, the greater the chances of long-term survival. That's why pap smears are such an effective tool in saving lives. And we do know from good research and practice that when someone develops a holistic cancer treatment plan, including attention to mind, body, and spirit, then recovery is more likely with better quality of life and extended life as well. Dr. James Gordon, director of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine here in Washington and an internationally recognized leader in the field of complementary medicine and alternative medicine will be testifying also about advances in complementary and alternative medicine cancer research. When Jane Seymour, a very prominent movie star, testified before our committee in February, she shared the story of several of her friends who had gone the conventional route of cancer treatment and then been told by their doctors 
that they had done everything they could and it was in, a, in essence hopeless. They were basically told to go home and die. These women did not accept that death sentence. They sought other health care professionals and advice from friends and family on other approaches to treating cancer. They learned, as many others have, that in order to survive the conventional treatments for cancer, radiation and chemotherapy, that a body needs to be strengthened through good nutrition. I am delighted that Michio Kushi is here today to talk to us about, macrobiotic, about the mac macrobiotic diet and that the importance of nutrition uh, is essential in cancer patients. Ms. Kushi is recognized throughout the world as the foremost authority in this field. The Smithsonian Institute has just opened the Mikushi, Mikushio Kushi, excuse me, Mishio Kushi Family Collection on the History of Macrobiotics and Alternative and Complementary Health Practices at the Natural, National Museum of American History. We will also be hearing from Susan Silver of the new Center for Integrative Medicine at George Washington University. This center has developed a program for women in cancer treatment with an integrative approach. Dr. Daniel Bielan is here today to update us on a new tool in the arsenal of early detection, regulation thermography. This low-cost test can be used as a complement to mammography for early detection of changes in breast tissue. It has been used in Germany, I believe, for about 10 years extensively. It is also proving to be a valuable tool in detecting other cancers like ovarian cancer and prostate cancer. We're looking into advances in research in prostate cancer, as I said earlier, and we plan to have a hearing early this fall. We expanded this investigation to cover all women's cancers because there's so much that needs to be done in breast cancer and other areas as well. For example, there's no reliable early detection test for ovarian cancer. 75% of ovarian cancers are not detected until the late stage, three or four, and there is only a 25% survival rate of more than five years. However, of those that are discovered in early stages, there is a 95% survival rate of more than five years. The symptoms of ovarian cancer are vague. They're bloating, sudden weight gain, gas, pressure, and lethargy. There is research to indicate that eating lots of meat and animal fats may increase a woman's risk of ovarian cancer. We need more good research in these areas to find solutions. The members of this committee on both sides of the aisle are very involved in the areas including Congresswoman Mink, who introduced H.R. 961, the Ovarian Cancer Research and Information Amendments of 1999. Linda Bedell Logan's sister died from cancer. During her battle, Linda's sister, like many cancer patients, suffered with lymphedema. Linda, who was involved in health care, researched her sister's treatment options and learned about combined decongestive therapy. As a result of this experience, she has helped many cancer patients gain access to this treatment by getting their insurance companies to cover the costs. Lymphedema is a serious complication for many cancer survivors. It causes swelling, usually in an arm or leg. It can be very painful, and it reduces a cancer survivor with cancer and how they go through them. The need to develop an individualized treatment plan to find reliable information on all treatment options and to be comfortable with the treatment choices they make. Lee Gardner and Carol Zariaki are two more cancer heroines. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If I didn't correct me when, she, when you come forward. Even though they have faced the most daunting enemy you can imagine, they have recovered, returned to living, and to helping others face cancer. The hearing record will remain open until July 25th for all those who wish to make written submissions on the record. And I now recognize my friend, recognize my friend Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that we're having a hearing on such an important issue. Breast cancer is the si second leading cause of cancer death among women. Cervical cancer will clo uh, kill close to 5,000 women this year. At least another 20,000 women will die this year from uterine and ovarian cancers. The real issues before us are how can we safely and effectively prevent, detect, and treat cancer? And how can we make sure that all women have access to good treatments and to accurate information about their treatment choices? Proper screening techniques can and have lowered mortality rates for breast and cervical cancer. We must continue to work hard to ensure that women have access to the screening techniques
currently available. And we must continue to educate women about the importance of being screened for these cancers. But this is not enough. We also have to make sure that health care providers follow up with women, notify them of their test results, and encourage them to return for further tests if necessary. We also have to make sure that quality treatments are available to all women. At the, at the same time, we need to continue to research better ways to detect cancers. Currently, there is no good test for ovarian cancer, the fifth leading cause of cancer death among women in the United States. And while mammography has been proven to reduce the number of breast cancer deaths in women over 50 years old by at least 30 percent, it has not been as effective in reducing cancer deaths among younger women. We need to continue to research screening techniques. We should also be looking at ways to prevent cancer. In 1993, I sponsored legislation that mandated a study of why certain localities were experiencing elevated incidence of breast cancer and elevated mortality rates. Oh. Studies such as these are important tools in understanding why women get cancers and how to prevent it. We need to know whether the causes are environmental, genetic, dietary, uh, and, and uh, any other uh, pl pl plausible theory. Uh, we need to no understand uh, what is going on and why some localities, uh, for no reason that we can otherwise understand, seem to produce an extraordinarily high number of breast cancers. We must concentrate our efforts on developing safe and effective ways to prevent cancer, to detect cancer, and to cure cancer. And we need to make sure that these therapies are available to all women. We have an extraordinarily high rate of uninsurance, lack of insurance among many Americans. 42 million was the last figure uh, of uninsured people in this country. No one is served by battling over the relative merits of alternative versus traditional medicine. Instead, our goal should be to develop the most safe and effective therapies possible, regardless of how they are classified. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that we're going to hear from so many important witnesses today. I want to apologize in advance because I have a conflict in my schedule. There's a, a markup on another, in another committee, so I won't be here to, to uh, listen to all of the witnesses. But I will have an opportunity to review the testimony and uh, look forward to doing that and to working with you and our colleagues uh, to accomplish the goals that we all share. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Micah? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a formal uh, opening statement, but I want to congratulate you on uh, conducting this hearing and uh, again reminding us of the importance of uh, early detection, prevention, and treatment, and uh, again compliment you on this and also reserve some time to introduce uh, one of our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Mr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think you know as well as anybody that this has been a very contentious committee over the last couple of years. You've heard that. I know that. You're kidding. Yeah, I know. You and Mr. Waxman know that. So it is very nice to see us getting away from that type of partisan hostility to focus on an issue of enormous concern every man, woman, and child in this country, and I thank you very much and your staff very much for putting on this hearing. Uh, what you, the remarks that you have made and Mr. Waxman have made cover a lot of what my opening statement was going to be, but I just want to say a few uh, additional words. You know, first of all, the fact that we're having a hearing on cancer today, probably 30 years ago, there would never have been a hearing like this because people said, well, cancer, it just we don't know why it happens. God strikes somebody and that's the way it goes. There is no cause for cancer. Remember that's, and in fact, we don't even talk about cancer. It's such a terrible thing. We use the C word, but we don't even talk about it because there's just nothing that can be done about it. So as a result of the work of a lot of people, we have come a long way and we're now beginning to take a rational look at, at the causes of cancer uh, and how we can uh, effectively treat it. Just think, not so many years ago, when you and I were younger, we watched on television and we saw physicians telling us the particular brand of cigarette they smoked. Do you remember that? Telling us that they like this brand uh, of cigarette. That was physicians advertising cigarettes. Well, we've come a long way from that quote-unquote conventional wisdom of doctors telling us about which cigarettes to smoke. 
20 or 30 years ago, 40 years ago, breastfeeding was told to women and mothers as to be a terrible thing. You certainly don't want to do that. And that were physicians. That was the, that was the, the norm. That was the, uh, the, the, what, what doctors were telling uh, mothers. I can remember 15 years ago in the city of Burlington talking to one of the leading physicians at our local hospital and say, well, what do you think about diet and disease? Oh, there's no connection between diet and disease. Doesn't matter what you eat. And now I think every American understands the important connection between diet and disease. And we, every day we are learning more and more about the relationship between indoor air, between uh, pollution in general, between stress and disease. The fact that there is not a huge gap between mind and body, as you indicated. People who are depressed, people who are under stress are more likely to come down uh, with a variety of illnesses than, than other people. We have also learned in recent years that some of those therapies and treatments that people around the world have been practicing for thousands of years are not quite as crazy as some of our quote-unquote leading specialists have told us. It was maybe 20 years ago, I may be wrong, it was James Reston of the New York Times ended up in China and he was ill and they practiced acupuncture on him and suddenly acupuncture became acceptable in the United States where for years our leading specialist had told us what a quacky and ridiculous idea that was. My point is that we are learning more and more uh, about causes and treatments and I think this hearing is an important part uh, in that process. I agree with you that we should be doing a lot more in expanding the Office of Alternative Medicine for example. They are, I should tell you, that we had Wayne Jonas who is the very capable head of that office in Vermont a couple of years ago, 500 people came out to a town meeting on alternative health in the state of Vermont on a snowy day in the central part of the state. Um, I am working on legislation, I know many other people are, to begin expanding complementary health care, making sure that Americans have access to that type of care. The other point that I would make is that one of the very sad aspects of what's going on in this country today is even when there are treatments available for cancer, uh, we have millions of people who do not have health insurance. So I would hope that we will join the rest of the industrialized world, and on this issue you and I may disagree or we may not, but the time is now that the United States should join the rest of the world and have a national health care system guaranteeing health care to all people. What is the sense of having treatments out there if you have millions of people who cannot afford that treatment? Where we do agree is I think we should expand and broaden our knowledge in terms of complementary health care. Europe is already way ahead of us, maybe less dependency on some powerful drugs if there are natural cures out there. And mostly, as I think you have indicated, let's study what's going out there. Let's learn. Maybe the treatments don't work, fine. But there's nothing wrong with exploring uh, all, all of the options that are out there. So I really do appreciate you holding this uh, hearing and look forward to uh, working with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you also for holding this important hearing. And during my tenure in Congress, I've been very actively involved in women's health issues, as you know, as a member of the uh, Congressional Caucus on Women's Issues and former chair. I've uh, been working with my colleagues uh, very diligently to increase the funding for women's health, including breast, ovarian, cervical cancer research. Uh, and as chair of the technology subcommittee of the science committee, been working to facilitate technology transfer between government agencies and the private sector. Efforts such as missiles to mammograms, uh, that project between the public health service, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community and NASA are critically important in applying new technologies uh, to the fight against breast cancer. The, Cong the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues has spent a great number of years attempting to address the neglect of women's health research at the National Institutes of Health, which as you know is in my district. The caucus asked the General Accounting Office back in 1989 to investigate the NIH policy regarding the inclusion of women in clinical studies. Women had been routinely excluded from many studies, such as the Physician's Health Study, which uh, study the uh, effects of aspirin on heart disease on 22,000 male physicians. And just this week, however, I, I found it a, a astounding. I read in the Washington Post that, quote, drinking at least two cups of caffeinated coffee a day lowers a man's risk of developing gallstones, unquote. Now, more than 46,000 men took part in this study that spanned a decade but what about, what about women? 
In 1990, the caucus introduced omnibus legislation, the Women's Health Equity Act, which included the establishment of the Office of Research on Women's Health and the requirement that women and minorities be included in all the clinical trials and protocols wherever appropriate in research studies funded by NIH, and that's been working. In the fall of 1990, a meeting of caucus members, NIH announced the formation of that office and quite frankly, we codified it in Congress, so it is a permanent office. And since that time, great progress has been made in funding for women's health concerns, particularly breast, ovarian, cervical cancer, osteoporosis, and the Women's Health Initiative. For example, breast and ovarian cancer funding at NCI, the National Cancer Institute, has more than quadrupled since 1990. And recently, I initiated a letter to the House Subcommittee on Defense Appropriations asking for continued funding for the Department of Defense peer-reviewed breast cancer research program for fiscal year 2000. Do you know that we have 223rd members of this House have signed on to that letter? However, our job is far from over. And despite great strides in women's health research, we still have to be vigilant have to address issues that aren't receiving public attention and research priority that they deserve. And that is why I think we are all open to the suggestions and uh, enhancing um, alternative medicines too. More than 14,000 women will die of ovarian cancer this year. Early detection is essential in the treatment of ovarian cancer, and yet there is no reliable early detection test. We know that if diagnosed and treated early, the survival rate for ovarian cancer is 95%. However, there are no obvious signs or symptoms until late in its development, and only about 25% of all cases are detected at the localized stage, and Congresswoman Mink has been very much involved in that uh, project. There are 2.6 million women living with breast cancer in the United States today. Each year, approximately 175,000 women are diagnosed. 43,300 women will die of breast cancer, which is the uh, leading cancer among women. Despite these frightening statistics, there are only three methods for, de for detecting breast tumors. Self-examination, a clinical breast exam by a physician, and the mammogram. I do want to comment that um, the uh, first uh, panelist um, is uh, uh, Patricia uh, Mack, as you mentioned, and I am just very proud of the fact that she is the executive co-chair of the Susan Komen uh, Race for the Cure. I have a picture, uh, Patricia, that was just taken of my running in the, um, in the race just last Saturday. It was the 10th anniversary. 67,000, 67,000 people um, ran in that race. Uh, bringing in a great deal of money, which will help with all the research projects, and I'm sure you'll tell us about that. As an aside, since we are all affected in some way by uh, cancers that affect women, my sister died 23 years ago of cancer, and at that time, we began raising her six children, I think, successfully. Lung cancer kills more women than breast cancer, and yet there's been very little emphasis on lung cancer in general. In 1998, 23,000 women died of lung cancer, and between 1974 and 94, there was a 147 percent increase in women diagnosed with lung cancer. Lung cancer tends to be a silent disease, and there are no good early detection programs in place for women or for men. And so, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for holding this important hearing on the early detection and alternative treatment of women's cancers. I look forward to uh, the testimony from the experts and from those who have had some experience. And again, I applaud you. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Morella. And uh, I was looking at this picture of you in the, in the race, and uh, what was your time? <laughs> I think more important than that was <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for um, your continuing leadership in this area and for the participation of members on this panel as well as our, our guests here today. Over 500 years ago, people thought the Earth was flat, and it caused many not to want to go on a voyage that could cause them to fall off the corner of the earth. 
Today there are still people who think that, uh, that illness and disease is something that's outside of us and that we can turn our health over to other people who will then tell us how we can be healthy. But through the work of people like Michio Kushi, who is one of the panelists today, uh, we have learned that we have the ability to take responsibility for our own health. What a miracle that is. Think about that for a moment. That the conditions which create disease may come from things that we do. And so if that is in fact the truth, how empowering it is that we can have some control over the conditions which are internal to our disease and which become externalized and can cause us to have a debilitation in our quality of life. Mr. Cushy, in joining this panel today, uh, brings to it a tremendous amount of experience in his work as uh, one of the foremost proponents in the world of macrobiotics, as all of uh, the students of, of uh, Greek and of medicine know, macrobiotics comes from the word macros and bios in Greece, which means uh, great life or long life. That was for, uh, a term that was co coined by Hippocrates about 2,500 years ago. Today, people know macrobiotics in a much more popularized way through foods like um, brown rice and seitan, which is a, a wheat uh, uh, cutlet, a whole wheat sourdough bread, uh, vegetable sushi, rice cakes. Uh, the standard macrobiotic diet has been practiced widely throughout history by all major civilizations and cultures. And the diet centers on whole cereal grains and their products and other plant uh, quali uh, qualities. Now, over the last 30 years, Michio Kushi has taught throughout the United States and abroad, giving lectures and seminars on diet, health, consciousness, and the peaceful meeting of Eastern and Western philosophies. In 1978, Mr. Kushi, uh, Kushi and his wife, Aveline, founded the Kushi Institute, which is an educational organization for the training of future leaders of society, including macrobiotic uh, teachers and counselors and cooks. The uh, Kushis, in 1986, founded One Peaceful World. It's an organization which uh, provides information on macrobiotic, uh, uh, macrobiotics and helps to guide society towards uh, world health and world peace. Now, one of the things that I think ought to be called to the attention of the members before we begin this uh, uh, hearing, uh, uh, from, hearing from the witnesses and the relevance to the people who are here to testify today because many of you are already aware of this. Later this year, the National Institute of Health is expected to issue a long-awaited study on the macrobiotic approach to cancer, which is currently being completed by researchers at the University of Minnesota and at Harvard University. Another report, which is a case control study from Italy, shows that macrobiotics can significantly lower the risk of breast cancer, and that report is awaiting publication. The American Cancer Society describes macrobiotics, and this is a quote, as the most popular anti-cancer <coughs> diet, unquote, today. On its internet site, the American Cancer Society states, and this is a quote, macrobiotics may help prevent some cancers. It may, risk, it may reduce the risk of developing cancers that appear related to higher fat intake, such as colon cancer and possibly some breast cancers. The macrobiotic diet, like other fat-free diets, can lower blood pressure and perhaps reduce the rate, uh, the chance, rather, of heart disease. Taking part in the macrobiotics program may provide some sense of balance with nature and harmony with the total universe, and as such, promote a sense of calmness and reduce stress. So when we uh, think in terms of health today, perhaps uh, rather than thinking in terms of, of simply winning a war, with cancer, we could also look towards changing the analogy and talk about prevention of cancer. Because some see cancer as a, a lack of balance. And as we bring our bodies more into their natural harmony, 
as Mr. Cushy, I'm sure, will be testifying about, we can find that conditions of health can be created where some may have thought previously it was impossible to do so. So this uh, hearing today, uh, through the testimony of the witnesses and uh, through the testimony of, of um, other experts, uh, such as uh, Mr. Cushy, will be an exercise in raising the nation's consciousness over the importance of looking at alternatives to health care, the importance of finding better ways to treat disease, and the importance of giving individuals an opportunity to reclaim power in their own lives, to improve the quality of their lives, and to, through their courage and example, give others hope that they can do the same. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for your efforts in calling these hearings, and I uh, look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. I'm, I'm awaiting a call to go to the floor for the debate on uh, the Kosovo spending bill, so I may not be able to be here for the whole time, but I appreciate being here now. Well, thank you, Mr. Kucinich. You've been a big help and appreciate your continued thank assistance. You. Uh, I might just hold up before our next uh, uh, member speaks that these are the, some of the books that uh, Mr. Cushy has. Uh, it's co-written, I guess, by Mr. Alex Jack. And here's a book uh, also, Let Food Be Thy Medicine. And uh, there's a number of books out like this. I'm not just touting these particular books. I don't get a commission. But uh, I think it's really important for anybody who's watching on television who is in the audience to take a look at some of these books because change in diet, I think, has been proven and will be proven in the future to be a real help in preventing various forms of cancer. With that, uh, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And may I, uh, like my colleagues, uh, thank you and compliment you on your initiative in, in holding this hearing uh, as a chair last year, uh, along with Nancy Johnson of the Women's Caucus. I am particularly appreciative for this effort. The Women's Caucus has uh, perhaps uh, devoted more of its time to cancer and especially breast cancer but other forms as well um, uh, including ovarian cancer than it has to any other women's issue. Last year when tamoxifen uh, was announced uh, as a drug that had proved so effective in treating breast cancer that they were stopping the trials and uh, letting it go forward uh, we held a whole hearing on that with the Surgeon General uh, the FDA and others coming in, including women who had participated in, in the trials. Uh, the progress in uh, dealing with women's cancers is so extraordinarily hopeful uh, today. I mean, just yesterday, uh, a major controversy that arose last year about whether women should begin to have mammograms at 40 or 50, where the women in Congress took the position that they should begin at 40, where there was some difference in, where there was some difference among the experts, then for goodness sakes, let's take uh, the expert, uh, let's err on the side of, of the expert that may save the most lives. Now, there is an additional study just announced yesterday that uh, affirms 40 as the age that you should start mammograms. Um, just today, I believe, a study, again, I think it was yesterday, perhaps uh, reported yesterday, a study, uh, again, about confusion among women and families about the role of estrogen, and we are told that estrogen, uh, in fact, does tend to uh, have and uh, it uh, tend to be a factor in some breast cancer, but those are the breast cancers that are easiest uh, to combat, and uh, that apparently it is not as much of a factor as we, we thought. Um, we all know that the most effective thing that a woman and a family can do to prevent breast cancer is early screening, and that uh, a early uh, mammogram could not be more important. Uh, the, the, we, we're coming, we, we had come to the point where breast cancer was breaking down along income lines and insurance lines. I am very pleased at the way in which mammograms 
uh, a mammography has, has become available to low-income women and minority women who are being left out and therefore being subjected to uh, discovery of their cancers much later when in fact they are often uh, not uh, uh, curable. The fact is that breast cancer, for example, and ovarian cancer are becoming curable diseases based almost entirely on early detection. Therefore, the emphasis on prevention in this hearing could not be more important. We're learning that cancer is many different diseases that act like, or at least a disease that acts like many different diseases. Uh, uh, and, and, and I must say, for that reason, cancer is nothing to play around with. Um, prevention, once the disease sets in, responsible treatment is going to be very important. The notion of alternative medicine, it seems to me, is critical here. Uh, if you believe that prevention is the best cure, uh, uh, the developing science on the role of fat and diet uh, must be taken very seriously, not only with respect to women's cancers, but generally. What I would like to, to, to uh, leave the hearing with, and I hope to be able to stay through most of it, I'm going to have to come and go because of other hearings, is with what I regard as the great need, and, and that is a word that I will take from what the chairman said, and use the word integration. That is to say, the integration of, of so-called alternative medicine with traditional medicine as is practiced uh, largely in the West. I mean, the fact is that, that the reason that we're able to cure so much cancer has to do with the genius of American medicine. Now, if we look further into alternative medicine, we may be, find the, the genius that enables us to help prevent uh, cancer. And then we will be able to bring the two together in, in, in a successful uh, integration. Um, I would hate to see the development of polar notions of medicine, that there's alternative medicine and then there's the other medicine. That is a tragedy. That is a false dichotomy. Moreover, we should not allow different sets of standards to develop for testing what is effective. Women have a right to know from their government what is effective, whether it comes out of nature uh, uh, in some uh, pure sense, or whether it is manufactured by a pharmaceutical company. And the role of government is to make sure that somehow uh, we can do our best work by finding safe, economical ways to integrate so-called alternative medicine with more traditional medicine so that there's no such, so those words disappear and, and, and it's all medicine. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me say that with the Women's Caucus, uh, the members of the Women's Caucus, I went to the Appropriation Committee where we go every year, Labor HHS, and instead of talking about uh, the diseases of women, I proposed a new program which I call LIFE. Uh, and I chose that acronym for lifetime improvement in food and exercise because I am appalled at the way in which particularly the baby boomers and children are setting themselves up for cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and every deadly disease known to man through overweight and obesity. Uh, it, the, the notions of fat and diet are very important, but they are important because of the natural ways in which they prevent uh, disease. Uh, I look forward to what our, uh, what our witnesses will have to say about uh, not only their experiences, but also about these ways of preventing similar experiences. And if I could just say on a personal note that I particularly am pleased to um, welcome Mrs. Connie Matt, because her husband and I have worked as closely together as I have with any member of the Senate or the House. He is not of my party. He has been uh, extraordinary in the way in which he has used his problem-solving skills to work with me on tax matters. And I know any man that's as good as that must have an awfully good woman for a wife. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure that Priscilla guides him in everything he does. <laughs> Ms. Mink. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <clears throat> do want to join my colleagues in uh, commending you for calling these hearings on such an important matter 
as uh, discussion on the needs for early detection and discussions of other kinds of preventive uh, measures that could be taken with respect to uh, women's health issues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, quite frankly, uh, notwithstanding my uh, eight years of effort in trying to get the Congress to uh, focus on the uh, one issue that I thought was terribly neglected uh, having to do with the uh, research necessary for finding some way in which we could detect the presence of ovarian cancer early enough to assure uh, that the life of the uh, woman could be saved. I've introduced legislation when I uh, discovered in 1991 uh, through uh, efforts by researchers at NIH and elsewhere that only eight million dollars of the entire NIH budget was devoted in any respect to uh, the research needed in ovarian cancer. And notwithstanding efforts of hundreds of women on this specific issue, we've only risen to a paltry level of forty million dollars. I have legislation in, Mr. Chairman, which I invite your co-sponsorship. Uh, calling for a uh, budget of $150 million, which even by itself is modest, if we are to uh, really uh, put the research efforts that are there to uh, discover a reliable early detection test that could save lives. It's important to talk about prevention and all the other aspects of your hearing today. But it seems to me that with the uh, scientific knowledge and uh, uh, the uh, intelligence and training and research capabilities of our uh, health researchers throughout the country, that we ought to be able to find a reliable uh, test that could save thousands of lives uh, of women who are uh, diagnosed today too late. Uh, to have their lives uh, saved. And so many of these women are, are young, just beginning in their, their life uh, situation. And it is something which I feel very, very strongly about uh, that has been neglected. And Mr. Chairman, this is really the first hearing in all these years of my effort to call attention to this deplorable situation and neglect. Uh, that we have had in the Congress. I've been to the Appropriations Committee, as my colleague here has indicated, every year asking for uh, earmarked money for this research effort, and the Appropriations Committee has refused to earmark any money uh, for ovarian cancer research. They have uh, uh, included report language, but never any earmarked money. So I urge my colleagues to consider the uh, legislation that uh, is before this uh, body and uh, join me in co-sponsoring. I believe it's essential and I believe that we are on the threshold of uh, a uh, research breakthrough. What is required is a commitment on the part of this Congress to steer our health uh, research industry to focus on this uh, very, very uh, pathetic neglect. We can clone um, sheep and mice and other things with our incredible intellectual capability. It seems to me that uh, within a few short years, we ought to be able to come up with a reliable test that could save thousands of lives each year. And I implore this committee to uh, continue this effort in calling attention to this serious health research neglect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I will be happy to co-sponsor your legislation. I think that Dr. Bieland may have some information that might be helpful in the research Thank you. toward Thank uh, you, these Chairman. cancers. Uh, are there other members, any other members that uh, wish to be heard? Mr. Osi? Mr. Cummins? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I look down our list of uh, witnesses, it makes my heart glad to know uh, that they are all in this room and they are special people who have decided that they want to touch other people's lives and are doing so every day and so I thank them for being with us today and I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, I'm also pleased that this hearing regarding detection and treatment of women's cancers has been scheduled today. 
The medical and scientific community has made tremendous breakthroughs in the early detection and treatment of women's cancers in the past few years. Even with all the options currently available for the early detection and treatment, the estimates for new incidences of these cancers are unacceptable. The National Cervical Cancer Coalition estimates that 2 million American women will be diagnosed with breast or cervical cancer in the 1990s and half a million will lose their lives. A disproportionate number of deaths will, will occur among minorities and women of low income. It is interesting that in my district in Baltimore sits Johns Hopkins Hospital. Johns Hopkins does a tremendous job of outreach, but at the same time, I know many women who are dying of these cancers every year. Virtually all of these deaths can be prevented by making life-saving screening services available to all women at risk. Common barriers to early detection screening include, and this is very interesting, women attempting to escape knowledge that they have cancer, prohibitive costs and unawareness of the availability of low-cost programs, lack of access to transportation to screening location, communication barriers, transportation to screening location, lack of physician referrals, and lack of child care. The Breast and Cervical Cancer <clears throat> Mortality Prevention Act of 1990 authorized the Center for Disease Control to implement a national cancer screening program. Through September 1996, the CDC has provided more than 1.2 million screening tests to low-income, uninsured or underinsured minority women. Alternate, alternative and complementary approaches to treating these cancers have also gained momentum. In 1998, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine was established within the National Institutes of Health. This has effectively engaged traditional biomedical research in the evaluation of, a, of alternative medical treatment using scientific models. However, until more is known about the many alternative and complementary treatments, conventional treatment methods hold the most promise. We hope for a cure in the near future. In the absence of a cure, the ability to implement a national program to detect and treat women's cancers depends in large part on the involvement of various partners in state and local governments, physicians, national and private sector organizations, and consumers. In the spirit of greater understanding and education of varied treatments of this disease, I look forward to hearing the experiences and opinions of today's witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Ms. Schakowsky? Uh, we, we will have uh, uh, two votes on the floor, uh, and we should be back here in about uh, 15 minutes. I apologize to the uh, people who will be giving testimony, but we'll get right to you just as soon as we get back, so please excuse us. We stand in recess uh, to the fall of the gavel about 15 minutes. will come to order. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we had some votes on the floor of the House. I'm sure members will be coming back in here as they leave the floor. Um, I'd like for our first uh, series of witnesses, Ms. Mack and uh, Mr. Cushy, Ms. 
to come forward, please, and take their seats. Ms. Mack, you can sit there on the left there. And Mr. Cushy can sit here on the right. Uh, I think I'll recognize my colleague uh, from Florida for an introduction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I am uh, indeed delighted to have this opportunity to introduce uh, someone very special to me. Uh, for the past two decades, I've known uh, the Mack uh, family. Uh, uh, had an opportunity to uh, be a friend and uh, also recently be a colleague uh, of uh, Senator Mack. Uh, I think that uh, there have been several comments already about the, the Mack family, and <clears throat> certainly Senator Mack is a gentle man, and uh, we have a gentle lady with us uh, today, his wife, and both are very accomplished uh, in their uh, particular areas of endeavor. Uh, the Mack family, like uh, many American families, and we've also heard that uh, among our members of Congress uh, cited today, have been af afflicted by uh, the rage, rages and ravages of, uh, of cancer. And uh, their family, the Mack family, has uh, been victimized by this uh, disease. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Mack, uh, Priscilla Mack, is a cancer survivor. And what's great about uh, Priscilla Mack is she took this uh, uh, this uh, adverse uh, adversity and this disease, and she turned it into a personal campaign of public awareness, public education effort uh, to uh, have millions and millions of American uh, women aware of the need uh, for prevention, uh, self examination, and the problems that related to uh, breast cancer. So uh, I am indeed uh, delighted and privileged to introduce a, a leader uh, in our state and in our nation. She's really our first lady in Florida in the fight uh, against uh, cancer and uh, really uh, our first lady uh, in the nation who uh, has brought to the uh, public, to the American women, uh, the need again for early prevention, uh, de detection, and treatment. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this honor and uh, welcome, Mrs. Mack. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. And I, I can recall back when uh, Connie and I first got elected in 1908. <laughs> that was 1982. Seems that long. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Connie came over to my uh, condo o over in Alexandria, and we sat on the floor and watched chariots of fire. You were down in Florida at that time, so Connie and I have been good friends for a long time, as well as you. And I remember watching your boy grow up. So I'm real happy you're here today. And Mr. Cushy, we're very happy you're here today. Uh, uh, I'm going to read your book, and uh, hopefully that'll save my life for a couple of years. So we'll start off with you, Mrs. Mack. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the Committee on Government Reform, and I commend you for holding this important hearing. I am here both as a breast cancer survivor as well as executive co-chairman of the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation's National Race for the Cure. In October of 1991, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Prior to the time of my diagnosis, I had followed all the recommendations with regard to having annual mammograms and clinical breast exams. However, it was through breast self-exam that I discovered my lump in my left breast. I underwent a modified mastectomy, followed by six months of preventative chemotherapy, five years of tamoxifen. In May the following year, I completed my reconstructive surgery. I also want to note that I had had my mammogram nine months before I found my lump. I had had my clinical exam three months before I found my lump. Early detection saved my life through my breast self-exam, and today I'm a breast cancer survivor. My goal is to share with as many women as possible the lessons I have learned as a breast cancer survivor. The most important lesson is a simple one educate yourself. When confined to the breast, the five-year survival rate is more than 95 percent. But women have to do three things. 
and through the American Cancer Society, of which I work, work also in Florida, we call it triple touch. And you'll see when I t mention these three things, why triple touch saved my life. One is your breast self-exams monthly. Two, mammograms as indicated by your physician. And three, your clinical exams. My message to women is simple, but important. Early detection saved my life, and it can save yours too. One of my efforts to help in the fight against breast cancer is my work on behalf of the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation's National Race for the Cure. Since its inception 10 years ago, the race has grown to the world's largest 5K walk run. The 10th anniversary Komen National Race for the Cure took place this last Saturday, June 5th, with a record number of 66,148 participants. I also found out that 43,000 crossed the finish line. I believe Congressman Morello was one of those 43,000. <laughs> we were honored that Vice President Al Gore and Tipper Gore served as our honorary chairs for the race. Breast cancer survivors took part in a special salute to survivors, which began with an inspirational walk at the foot of the Washington Monument. We also had a large bipartisan contingency of Washington lawmakers and more than 2,500 participants from 72 countries around the world. Most importantly, thousands of my breast cancer survivors wearing pink t-shirts all, uh, all participated from all across this great land. Last year, the Komen National Race for the Cure awarded $1.8 million in grants to 24 Washington, D.C. area hospitals, research centers, breast health organizations, national grant programs of the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. These grants provide funding for breast health programs, including research, screening, treatment and education programs. This year, we are pleased to announce that we will give approximately $2.5 million in grants to be awarded from this year's race. Since its inception, the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation has raised more than $136 million through the work of its local affiliates in more than 100 communities across the country. Once again, let me offer my heartfelt thanks to the many, many members of the Senate and the House of Representatives who participate in the Komen National Race for the uh, Cure series throughout the year. With each advance we make in finding a cure for breast cancer, we are one. In each advance we make in finding a cure for breast cancer, we are one step closer to winning the race. I'd like to, before I close, mention to you all how cancer has touched our lives personally. Um, through this all, I want you to keep in mind that many of us are alive today because of early detection. My husband's mother was a 25-year breast cancer survivor. My husband's brother died of melanoma at the age of 35. His was not detected early. My daughter is a 10-year survivor of cervical cancer. Early detection saved her life, and because it was detected early, we now have a third grandson after the fact. She is in perfect health. Uh, my husband was diagnosed with melanoma in 19, right after he was elected to the Senate. Early detection, and due to the profound experience we had with his brother, early detection saved my husband's life. And then I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and early detection saved my life. Unfortunately, Connie's mother died of renal cancer, Connie's father died of esophageal cancer, and my stepmother died of ovarian cancer. When we say early detection until we find a cure saves lives, but me meaningful things like this hearing and all that the doctors and the researchers are doing, I pray to God will end this dread disease. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee. Thank you very much, Priscilla. It's uh, good seeing you again. And I, I was not aware of all the tragedies that your family had uh, had had to endure. We, we've had some ourselves, but uh, man, that's a lot. So here to be commended, and Connie's to be commended for all the extra efforts you you put forth to help out, Mr. Cushy. 
Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. <coughs> the Honorable Chairman and also Government Reform Committee members, I very much appreciate the fact that conventional medicine has developed its technologies with the goal of diagnosing and treating various illness. We desire the continuous support of the physical and other approaches that conventional medicine offers for the treatment of sickness. On the other hand, the conventional approach is a symptomatic approach and therefore does not focus on revealing or applying understanding of the cause which underlies disease. Number two, Professionals engaged in the practice of conventional medicine often lack an understanding support of other healthcare approaches. Number three, conventional treatment, including its method of diagnosis, has always produced side effects. This is especially true when treatments are over-applied and often result in the severe suffering of those who receive such treatments. Four, conventional medicine method of diagnosis and medical treatment are always expensive and often beyond the average person's income. As a result, also often becomes the responsibility and burden of the government, the public, and the insurance systems. Based upon these points, the tendency of individuals to search out these alternative approaches, so-called alternative complementary health practice, has increased over the past many years, beginning commencing from about 40 years ago. Currently, approximately 50% of those who are suffering from disease are searching for and receiving unconventional method of treatment. As a demonstration of these trends, consider the example of cancers that affect women. One, over the past 40 years, it has been my experience, as well as that of my associates, that many women are hesitant to receive chemotherapy, radiation, and other intensive treatments. Two, many women who receive conventional care seek alternative method as a result of intensive suffering, both physical and emotional, that they, they experience by conventional medical treatment. They seek out mild approaches. Three, many patients desire to know the cause of the cancer from which they are suffering, yet they do not receive satisfactory answers. The cause of women's cancer, as is true of the majority of physical and emotional sicknesses, lie in daily lifestyle and dietary practice. For example, in the case of breast cancer, the majority cause, the major cause are overconsumption of high fat foods, including dairy food, and simple carbohydrates such as refined sugar and sweets. In the case of ovarian cancer, the majority dietary factors are the overconsumption of eggs and poetry, as well as of other high fat, high cholesterol animal foods. In the case of uterine cancer, Dietary cause includes overconsumption of animal food and heavy dairy fats such as those found in cheese. In the case of cervical cancer, similar to prostate cancer in man, the primary dietary factors are the overconsumption of oily and greasy foods, salty foods, hard baked flour products, and heavy animal foods. In the case of thyroid cancer, the primary cause are overconsumption of eggs, poultry, dairy fats, and hard baked flour products. In the case of pancreatic cancer, consumption of poultry, cheese, shellfish, and hard baked flour products are contributing factors. 
In the case of skin cancer, causes include overconsumption of oily food, sweets, and dairy fat, uh, high fat foods. In the case of leukemia and lymphoma, dietary cause includes overconsumption of dairy fats, sugar, and sweets, as well as oily and greasy foods. Overconsumption of stimulants and aromatic substances such as hot spices, alcohol beverages, and caffeine accelerate the speed of spread of the cancer condition. Other lifestyle factors such as cigarette smoking, physical inactivity, exposure to high levels of electromagnetic fields or radiation, and the consumption of chemically treated foods and water also contribute to, contribute to the development of cancers. Non-organic chemical, chemically cultivated agriculture, irradiation, microwave cooking, and similar methods of unnatural food production and artificial processing, as well as dairy and natural lifestyle are potential factors as well. The microbiotic approach, which attempts to correct these undesirable characteristics of the current American lifestyle and dietary behaviors, has been practiced by many individuals since the 1960s. Beginning as a grassroots movement, the microbiotic approach led, have led to the initiation of the natural food movement and organic agriculture. The microbiotic approach continues to gain popularity and currently influences many millions of people. As a healthcare practice, this approach has helped to prevent disease and speed recovery times associates associated with numerous sicknesses, including many types of women's cancer. Among those in today's audience, the following seven, six, seven ladies are present. They have experienced various types of cancer and also have recovered through the macrobiotic approach. Uh, Chris Akba, would you stand up? A former physicist from Pennsylvania who recovered 14 years ago from inflammatory breast cancer, which is predicted in two, three months, their lifetime. Marlene McKenna, a mother of four, radio television commentator and investment broker from Rhode Island, who recovered 16 years ago from malignant malignoma spread to the small intestines. Judy McKenna, McKenna, a clothing designer from Florida who recovered eight years ago from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four. Catherine Powers, Stone Mountain, Georgia, diagnosed 1985 endometrial cancer stage four Diagnosed 1993, uh, uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma stage 3 terminal. Deborah Wright, Athens, Georgia, diagnosed 1995, interdictal carcinoma breast cancer stage 2B. Lynn Mader, Arlington, Virginia, diagnosed. 89, Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage 4B. Leeds Klein, Tampa, Florida, diagnosed 1985, 30 various kinds of sick symptoms, including the brain damage and breast cancer due to suspected result is that due to the, the breast implants. This uh, Mr. Norman Arnold, a business leader and philanthropist from South Carolina who recovered 17 years ago from pancreatic cancer spread to limp and liver. These ladies and gentlemen will be available for interview later if you wish. Not only have they survived their illnesses, but they have actively contributed to society for many years following recovery without recurrence of cancer. Majority of those cases 
are the old terminals. These people are only a few examples of many who have recovered from cancer. In addition, many hundreds of women and men have received benefits from macrobiotic approach. The National Institute of Health made a small grant of about $30,000 to the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. This fund was applied for the collecting of data and the gathering of medical records. The data are now under review by the research group from Harvard Medical School and oncologist from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In contrast to the conventional approaches, the macrobiotic approach also relates and includes not, the, uh, not denying the conventional approach also, but also such, as, such practices as oriental herb medicine, acupuncture, moxibustion, and shiatsu massage, as well as other physical body care, emotional meditation, and psychological therapy practices as as they are necessary. <coughs> we highly recommend that the government supports the following. One, please make the available public education regarding a proper healthy way of eating, mainly using grain and vegetable base and more natural lifestyles. Two, Increase funds available for research regarding the effectiveness of alternative complementary approaches for both prevention and recovery, and including diet and lifestyle as a base. Three, make recommendations to all health facilities and medical schools to accommodate healthful menus and cooking instructions, as well as to teach a proper healthy lifestyle. Or, advise selected hospitals or healthcare centers to establish a pilot plan for macrobiotic diet or similar diet and lifestyle together with data creation as a clinical trial. Five, advise Please advise medical and healthcare professionals of simple, practical ways of diagnosis based upon oriental diagnosis of the face, pulse, meridians, and the vibration in order to affect low cost early detection. Six, establish community and school based educational programs, including school lunch programs and high, sc uh, high school home economics classes to recover home cooking and a healthy lifestyle. Seven, we would be happy to cooperate with such governmental efforts or public efforts by dispatching or sending well-experienced macrobiotic educators, counselors, and cooking instructors to any potential facilities. We recommend the funding of educational training centers at the level of college or professional schools. Women are, in my humble opinion, strong opinion, the center of love, beauty, health, and longevity, and happiness among humankind. Home and family are the base for health and happiness. If this country Establishes, establishes these ways of health and happiness and prevents and treats physical and emotional disorders in a more natural way, America will become a symbol of health and happiness for the entire planet. America will become a leading light for all humankind beyond the establishment of power, uh, politics, and the economies, this is the way of a great America to open a new era of humanity for the 21st century. In this way, America will become the creator of one peaceful world for healthy mankind. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and to present my <laughs> Thank you.
Sounds like some people like you quite a bit. <laughs> I don't even get that kind of applause when I go home. <laughs> First of all, let me ask a few questions here. Uh, Ms. Mack, when you had your breast cancer, did you have it in any of your lymph nodes? No, I did not. It was did diagnosed it? early enough. Um, I had it, uh, no lymph node involvement, and therefore my prognosis was Very much good. better. Did, uh, did you have any chemotherapy? Yes, I did. I had six months of uh, preventative chemotherapy. At the time I was diagnosed, the protocol for um, uh, breast cancer without node, lymph node involvement had gone to six months of preventive chemotherapy uh -huh. uh, following a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't done even a year before. Uh, usually they um, didn't follow it along with anything. And, and then the five years of tamoxifen yeah. after that. Did you have radiation too? No, I did not. You did not have to have radiation? No, I did not. Well, I recall when uh, my wife had her breast cancer and she did have it in five of her lymph nodes and that's why the prognosis was not that good. And uh, one of the most tragic things that people go through is when they start to, women start to lose their hair after the uh, chemotherapy. And so uh, I just wish everybody in America could have the opportunity to share the kinds of pain, mental pain, that men and, men and their women and their husbands go through when that sort of thing occurs in addition to uh, the other side effects of uh, cancer that affect the family life. Well, you're to be commended for what you're doing, and we really appreciate it. And I'm sure other members will have questions for you. I do want to ask the, Mr. Cushy a, a few questions. Uh, you have uh, apparently a lot of these people had diseases that were would have been deemed terminal illnesses before they went on your program. Uh, some of those people I, uh, you mentioned had uh, lymphatic ca cancer and they also had uh, cancer that had spread into the stomach and into the pancreas and I, I heard one that said the liver which I always thought was a, a terminal situation. How do you account for the reversal of their problems? Is it strictly because of the macro macrotic bi uh, diet you talked about? The Macrobiotic cause diet. of cancer are heavily related caused by daily eating. For example, pancreatic cancer case. As I mentioned, heavy poetry eating. Poultry. Poetry uh -huh. and egg eating. And also shellfish eating and hard baked flour, etc. Of course, heavy fatty oily food. So now when we approach we must reduce, eliminate, or reduce those web eating and recommending more grain, vegetables, and other healthy ones. And we try to eliminate as soon as possible from his body or patient body the effects accumulated those fat and accumulated those bad influence. How do you eliminate that? Some people yeah. talk about things like chelation therapy. Uh, do you just do it by diet? Through the diet, very simple way. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to present maybe one example. Sure, she, yeah. yeah. She will talk about that. Hi, my name's Chris Akbar, and I'm one of Micho's assistants in Boston. Um, um, in 1985, I was dosed, diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer at Yale New Haven Hospital. I was a grad student working on a PhD in physics at the time. And my diet consisted primarily of ice cream, chocolate, cheese omelets, and pizzas. I was very fat. I weighed 170 pounds. And um, primarily diet, dairy food and sweets. Um, I, in, I discovered a red hot inflammation um, in my breast, very painful. And I went and had um, penicillin for two weeks and nothing happened. And then I had a mammogram, it showed nothing. I had ultrasound, no it showed nothing. And then I finally had a surgical biopsy. They told me I had inflammatory breast cancer. And this was in 1985, and they told me I had two or three months to live. They said it was the most lethal, it was immediately in my lymphatic system. I said, why do I have cancer to my doctors? And this was at Yale Medical School, and they had a lot of research there, and they said it's genetic. But nobody ever had cancer in my whole family. And then I said, what can I eat? I am huge. I'm obese. What can I eat? They said, don't lose an ounce, because if you lose any weight, um, cancer is going to be killing you even faster if your body's starting to waste away. So have some chocolate 
Southern Shore, which is made out of basically sugars and oils, and, um, and have they had they served as chocolate covered donuts in our in the waiting lounge of the radiation laboratory where I was going, and I thought something was a little bit strange. Anyway, um, I started chemotherapy the next day. It was um, uh, CAF. It was adriamycin 5-FU and, and cytoxin. And adriamycin made my hair fall out within three weeks and I was, you know, I was devastated by that. Plus every, and nausea and I went through menopause at the age of 33 basically because of the drugs. And then um, I, I uh, did radiation twice a day for six weeks and that was a very intense experience also. Meanwhile I had read a book about macrobiotics. Um, it was by a physician from Philadelphia who had prostate cancer that had spread throughout his bones and he was basically a hopeless case. He was the chairman of Methodist Hospital and um, he picked up some hitchhikers who were hippies back in the, in the late 60s who said try a macrobiotic diet, it'll save your life. Well he did and after, two, after a one year of macrobiotics he was completely cancer free with no other medical treatment and he was on a gourmet French diet. It was heavy fats, heavy meats, heavy sauces, wine, everything. The, the normal, uh, he was from Philadelphia and he went to the Lebec fan restaurant basically. I was on a gourmet chocolate diet and I said, this is the cause of my problem. I really think dairy food goes to the mammary part of my body and creates a problem. It just makes sense. And I picked up a book, that cancer prevention diet book you have. It said dairy food and sweets is the primary cause of breast cancer and that was my, what, the main thing I was doing. And it said, stop those things and start taking some things to clean it out. Well, I came to Micho for counseling and his wife had just done her cookbook and I said, this is my Bible, I'm just gonna follow this book. And um, I did, and Micho gave me very simple remedies. He gave me a plaster made out of barley and cabbage that I just put on my breast every night. In five days, I felt the tumor getting smaller and softer. He gave me something to reduce my weight. Simple vegetables made, like daikon, which is a long white radish, and carrots. I did, just made it, grated them and ate that every day. I lost 50 pounds within like two months, and all this fat came off of me. I, I had a really bad pancreas from so many eggs and cheese I had eaten, and he gave me a simple drink made out of carrots, onions, and squash called sweet vegetable drink. I took that and my pancreas cleaned out and I no longer had sweet cravings. I didn't want chocolate every afternoon at four o'clock. And I had chronic constipation. I think that's often in, um, associated with breast cancer because not, the toxins sort of build up in your body when you can't eliminate them. And he gave me something to strengthen my intestines, a simple like oriental drink made out of a or the, a, a root powder that kind of like a starch that strengthened my intestines. Well, I just did his diet. I, I never had touched in 14 years since. I haven't touched any ice cream or chocolate or dairy food or meat, and I don't miss it at all or sugar. And after two months, I got incredible diarrhea one night, and I wondered what was happening. And the next morning, I had realized that my entire tumor that was hanging on here was completely t discharged out of my body naturally. What had happened was in your intestines when you eat, the um, nutrients from the foods that you're eating are absorbed and it changes the quality of your blood. And if you're taking these things, like I mentioned, these macrobiotic type things, it actually goes through like a solvent and goes in and through your body and cleans everything out. So as I was losing all of this fat, everything was literally, along with the tumor, was just absolutely discharged out of my body. It was very effective. And I kept, I'm a scientist, so I kept very careful records of what I was doing and how my body was reacting. I found if I took any extra oils, he had told me oil is like throwing, um, like throwing oil onto a flame, which was this inflammatory tumor. If I ate any oil, the redness would come back, and in fact, it did. The inflammation, I could actually cause the inflammation to come back. I, I just li literally eliminated all of that stuff that caused the cancer, took these things, these um, vegetables and grains and, and beans and seaweeds and whatever to clean out, and literally it flushed out of my body and saved my life. So in two months, when I was supposed to be dead from the medical treat, after, you know, even with the medical treatments, it saved my life. It was so effective. It literally used the, the food as a cleaner to go through and clean out your body. Very effective. I was really impressed. <laughs> so I'm alive. 14 years later, here I am. <laughs> I would guess you would be impressed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Those, those friends, besides many hundreds of other people, have been experiencing similar way. Well, thank you, Doctor. My, my time has expired. Let me yield now to uh, my colleague, Ms. Norton. Both of uh, uh, these testimonies have been uh, very, very impressive and very important. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, Mr. Kushi, what is your background? Uh, My background. That led you, what is your training or your background either that led you to the development of, of your approach? Fortunately, I was not uh, in medical school. And I was a political science student, international law. After the end of the war, 
the world war. I wanted to be the world, uh, I want to have the world peace. So I became world federalist, and Mr. Norman Cousins and the friends that uh, they were sponsored of me, and I came at the age of 20, 23 years old to America, 50 years ago. Then, uh, while I was studying in Columbia universities, the uh, uh, graduate course, uh, all accumulating various kinds of documents, the drafts of world constitution and other related documents, I started to wonder whether uh, even this uh, world government, world federation is done, how about sickness, how about love? How about caring people? How about prejudice or discrimination, those mental problems? And then I wonder, unless those things were corrected, there is no <coughs> world peace. So I started to search the solution, including the visiting to Dr. Einstein and Mr. Norman Cousins and various Thomas Mann and so forth. There are no active, the clear answers. Because we have, thousand years have the made religions, hoping to make people better. But between religions, then they fight arise. And then we hoped education high and also the material prosperity. Then again, unfortunately, their sickness spread, crime spread. So I started to, all, I gave up all political science studies and I started to stand in New York, the, in New York Times Square and Fifth Avenue. I started to watch people, what is humanity is, what is human beings. Two months and a half it took, then I understood. Everyone has been, mankind has been made by two factors, environment and what we eat. And what they eat is entirely in our hand, freedom. Individual people are the, uh, freely choosing, freely cooking, so forth. Then, now, if proper diet in the environment, certain environment is done, then healthy and happy condition comes. If not, then sickness arises, crime arises, violence <coughs> arises, etc. So, after I saw that, I found that then American diet, suppose 19th century, 20th centuries, comparing 19th centuries, 20th centuries, tremendous change, more increasing animal food, more increasing dairy food, more increasing refined sugar, more increasing mass production of food, chemicals, agricultural products, etc. so forth. Exactly parallel way, heart disease increasing, cancer increasing, and various kinds of so-called degenerative disease are increasing, as well as so-called virus disease, and also mental problems are increasing. So, wanted to have to change our current way of eating. There began so-called natural food movement and cooking class, this and that, etc. That is uh, my background. Well. It, it is certainly true that the, the correlations, uh, uh, particularly when studying uh, populations in different countries, certainly has begun to show the associations that you uh, indicate. Uh, I, I also note that, that in your testimony, you indicate, you seem to have an integrative approach as well. You uh, indicate the debt we owe to conventional medicine, and then you, you indicate that there are certain things that medical schools and others can do. Uh, to integrate these approaches uh, in order to get better results for people who yeah. have the disease or to prevent the disease. Uh, may I ask if the people whom, who are under your care, if you require that they not engage in conventional treatment, uh, or if some of them have also uh, been engaged in, con in conventional treatment while uh, being involved with your diet? That, those things are up to the patient. The entire patient has entire freedom. However, because the cause is the diet and lifestyle. So base is a cause, base is diet, proper diet and proper lifestyle. Then in addition to that 
correction, patient if they want chemotherapy or radiation or acupuncture or herb medicine, that's fine. They can attach it. But I hope this treatment can be mild and not overdosed. Because in my opinion, and in other people's opinion, by overdose of chemotherapy, overdose of radiation, often affects so much suffering of patients, not only sufferings, I wonder, maybe shortening their life also. Moderate approach, I hope, <laughs> the medical the treatment can take. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say to Mr. Kushi, I think in increasingly many people adopt the point of view you just expressed that the, that the treatment is worse than the cure and many people forego such treatments. I just want to say in, in closing to Ms. Mack how important her leadership uh, has been uh, that, that when, when you have come forward and others like you have come forward, you uh, cannot imagine the effect you've had on people who would not otherwise come forward by doing the race there are women whose attention we could not possibly get except through uh, the dramatic intervention of, uh, of well-known women who are first willing to indicate that they have had the disease and then willing to show that the disease can be uh, defeated. And I certainly want to thank you for that. I have a sister uh, who's now president of a college. Uh, who has had breast ca cancer and feels herself entirely cured. And since I'm her sister, <laughs> not only do I want her to be cured for that reason, but because this thing may also run in families, I certainly appreciate the, the leadership you have given uh, to this work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Mr. Mack. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Mack, I just had a couple of questions. First of all, uh, your leadership has been tremendous uh, in the private sector and providing awareness and also raising funds and you cited in your testimony how much money had been raised privately just uh, uh, by the uh, activities you've been involved in uh, maybe you could comment to the uh, committee uh, on your suggestions for uh, research uh, and for funding and what what do you think would be a appropriate private uh, public uh, mix uh, of funds? Well, I, I believe um, the Congress is doing an awful lot in the doubling of the monies for EI NIH, uh, which Connie's been involved with, to the, getting the funding doubling, doubled for NIH will help all, is, all diseases. And I believe that all that we do in research is where we're going to find the true answer to um, not just cancer but um, all other diseases and through research through alternative medicines research in every way is going to make the difference uh, public and private we all have to work together it is a large problem and the government can't do it alone and neither can the private sector and I think whenever we can partner and whenever we can work together the, the cures and the uh, research will come to make a difference uh, one of the other things that I wanted to ask about was you had talked about uh, awareness and self-examination and uh, there seems to be uh, somewhat of a lack of uh, public awareness uh, how do you think we should best approach uh, these campaigns uh, from a po private uh, sector standpoint or public or combination? What, what do you think is most effective in getting the message that you're trying to, to uh, get uh, out to uh, women and others? Uh? Well, I believe it's through hearings like this, through races, through ac uh, advocacy that all the women in this room and all the people in the cancer communities do. Every, uh, we have we are blessed in this country with many generous, wonderful people who raise money in the uh, private sector, but also our Congress and our administration work diligently to find the answers to cancer in particular, diseases in particular. But I just think we have to continue. 
we, we can't sit, rest on our laurels. We have to continue to be out front and uh, continue the fight and to make more people aware. I mean, as, as um, obvious or as out front as I have been and Dr. Cushy and everyone else, there are many, many people out there who haven't heard a word we've said. We have to continue to get to the underserved. We have to continue to get the message out that early detection until we find a cure is the way to deal with most diseases, if you find it, or prevention through ways that have been proven to make a difference. And it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of heart. And through public and private, we can do it together. We cannot do it alone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cushy, uh, you spoke quite a bit about uh, diet and uh, changes in lifestyle uh, and prevention. Uh, what do you see as uh, the role of uh, uh, research uh, today and uh, how important do you think that is in uh, finding a cure for cancer or addressing uh, cancer treatment? There are many approaches for cancer treatment and many ways uh, we should have also examined and research should be done. However, as I pointed out, basic problem of the cancer and other ailment, other uh, disease, our well-being and daily life. Therefore, associate from diet and daily life, and there, if more research goes, and what kind of result coming, such as pilot pilot test in the clinical test in the hospital, this and that, etc., and data accumulations. For example, it's very easy, like uh, uh, blood pressure down or cholesterol down, or etc. It's very easy by changing diet. Same thing like diabetes, very easy that to offset, even though the, uh, the insulin has been uh, consuming. And the overweight situation is also very easy by dietary control. Similar way that if you subject, let's study about this, this type of cancer, or this study, let's study this, this type of sickness or uh, arthritis, whatever. How diet is related? And suppose I or someone else that will be very happy this kind of diet will offset to that or reduce that or prevent that. While current way of eating continue together with any medical treatment, how difference comes? And it's very clear you can see that. And then after you accumulated those data, then you can apply in the hospitals, you can apply other health clinics. Those data can be created easily, six months, one year, or at most two years time. Enough data which we can convince the people who are working in the healthcare field and the educational field. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Uh, Ms. Ming? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to compliment both of our uh, witnesses. You have uh, very inspirational messages, not just to this committee and the Congress, but to the American people at large. I detect the common theme of both of your testimonies is a sense of personal responsibility. In your case, uh, Mrs. Mack, your detection was by yourself through self-examination. And the message there is that notwithstanding all the um, medical instruments that are now available for uh, detecting uh, breast cancer, uh, the, uh, there is really no substitute for the once a month <coughs> self-examination procedure. And in uh, your case, uh, Mr. Cushy, the uh, knowledge that um, what you eat is what you are, I think is an important uh, message that uh, we have to take very, very seriously. And I do think that the points you make in your testimony, uh, Mr. Cushy, have been well expressed. 
uh, by uh, nutrition experts, by people in the medical profession who are constantly <clears throat> hammering on your diet and don't eat fats and stay away from this or that. <clears throat> and so I think the <clears throat> general message is not that different in terms of <clears throat> the medical profession <clears throat> and what you are espousing. The uh, uh, point, however, of getting the message down earlier in life, particularly in uh, areas like the school lunch program, in our schools, and in our training programs. I've been told that medical doctors have less than one course subject on nutrition and, and the diet. And they go out and uh, they are uh, treating patients with very serious illnesses with very little perception about the importance of diet. So I think we have to carry the message to the professionals uh, uh, and uh, convince them that the words they espound about diet truly have meaning. And I think that that is what you have brought to this committee. And I um, commend you for your work and for your leadership and uh, commend your book. And, and I will get a copy and Read it from cover to cover. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mink. Uh, Ms. Merla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to have heard both of you and, and to uh, Mr. Cucci to have had the women who have appeared here and gentlemen to uh, comment on the successes. Um, Priscilla Mack, you're so right. You know, over and over again, you said early early diagnosis makes the difference and, and I, I'm pleased that in in my area with the American Cancer Society with a number of hospitals involved with Hadassah uh, we have been bringing a program called check it out to high schools and inviting the 11th and 12th grade females to come together in an assembly and to learn self-examination they learn it with, I mean, they ask very graphic questions. They learn it not only so they can get into the habit of doing it, but so that they can be the messenger to bring the message to their older sisters, their mothers, their grandmothers, their friends. And I guess that this is something from what you said, having, in terms of how you even discovered uh, that you had a, a challenge, uh, it is through the self-detection. So I, um, I want you to know how much I appreciate what you have done and the fact that you brought an enthusiasm and such strength to uh, to the whole concept of, of research and, and our own personal involvement and certainly the Coleman race to the cure, for the cure. No wonder the money has doubled over the last year because we've had inspirational people. So thank you. Um, I, I'm interested, Mr. Cushy, whether or not, first of all, these people um, who are such great testimonials to the concept of, of, of the dietary facet of it. Do they come to you as a last resort? And how do they hear about you? And do you have any centers in Maryland? <laughs> right, right. Your home, I hope your house will become a center in the near future. <laughs> First of all, many people are coming uh, to see me on my associates or teacher, macro teachers. As many of them have received already medical treatment and they was declared no way the terminal case. Or the, they themselves dissatisfied the result of the medical treatment. And those people come. Probably those people, maybe 40% of people. Second is the uh, people who got sickness and diagnosed. Then they start, before they uh, receive conventional treatment, they start to search alternative way and came to us. That is second approach that may be about 30% or so. Other number of people were, for the sake of keeping their health, for the case of the precaution, they also come. That's about general ratio. And the 
people who have come to us because they found and because they found at that time maybe that stage maybe one or two or three or whatever the different stage but as I said and as you know many women are hesitant to go drastic treatment and so before receiving treatment as such as well as the, after they receive some drastic treatment then they were still said you are no hope then they start to search that kind of place. Do they hear about you basically through your book? Yeah, mm. through words, through Word books. of mouth, uh, right. word spread. That's right. Just, we have never, we are not a commercial venture, so we, are not, we never advertise, but through the books, through the education, and also our educational center, the Christian Institute in Massachusetts. However, through that education for many years, many graduate and develop those teachers. Throughout the world, several thousand teachers working here and there. And in this country, many states, many cities have also macrobiotic teachers. They are doing cooking class, they are doing health advice, or various their social work. You would, it seems to me, suggest that doctors, that all doctors, um, all of the health practitioners include as part of their um, treatment that there be the, the recognition of how food as well as exercise and, and uh, other moderate lifestyles, the, the, the role that food plays. Now, she mentioned some of the mixtures that you made I mean, do you have to have it in mixture form? Can you just have like good vegetables and have a list of do's and don'ts? And yeah. does it have to be mixed <laughs> in a certain proportion? Yeah, depends on, right? For example, like, you know, that like colon cancer. Yes. The more they're caused by beef and pork and cheese, et cetera, right? eggs. Then eliminating that effects, we need the, like greater daikon, greater carrots, or, for the, or the green leafy vegetable juice, so forth. The more opposite factors we bring, but the opposite energy factors. And in the case of like the, uh, I would say that like the uh, intestinal problems, then there, the traditionally, the oriental countries that has been used, the kazu, kazu, uh, and also the uh, umeboshi plum, that is uh, pickled plums, that are very good for digestion. And also suppose if you want to straighten out pancreatic cancer, then uh, you better have sweet vegetables, like cabbage, carrots, like the, uh, the squash and onions, those fine, finely chopped uh, equal amount and three, four times water, and. Uh, the uh, cook 20 to 25 minutes. That sweet drink, vegetable drink, drink every day one cup, two cups. That making easy. The something like our approach is number one, safest approach. Number two, cost very little. Number three, at home they can practice and use food substance, food, which they can get very easily, using them and making home remedies. I guess I'm going to have to buy the book. Thank you very much. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> to Ms. Mack, I want to thank you for, um, <clears throat> for being a leader in this area. So often what happens, it's, uh, I think it was Martin Luther King Sr. That, who said that you cannot lead where you do not go and you cannot teach what you do not know. And so often people go through uh, difficulties and once they get through their difficulties, they almost act like it never happened. But you, not only have you remembered, but you have acted on them to try to help other people. 
And I think that there is uh, no greater thing that we can do as human beings than to use our pains and our problems and to turn them around uh, and use them as a passport to help other people. And so I thank you for your leadership. Um, I, as I was looking at the, uh, this, uh, the statement of uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Kushi, um, I just want to just ask you a few questions because it, I, I'm tr truly fascinated. Mr. Chairman, I'm so glad you had this panel because I did not expect to be, it to be so interesting. Um, <laughs> are, are you inferring that this committee is not interested? <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> one of the things that you talk about is cost, that so many people, um, they can't get health care because of the cost. I mean, I guess may not have insurance or whatever. And I'm sure it must be very frustrating to you, uh, and probably you, I'm sure you too, Ms. Mack, when you're on this mission to help people and to know that cost of treatment is something that uh, because people can't afford certain treatments, that people are literally not only suffering, but dying. I mean, that must be a very frustrating thing for you all, and I just like for you all to comment on that. I agree. And uh, for example, modern conventional medicine, doctors learn in medical school, trained. There is no single cause or nutrition diet, but by eating, we form blood, we form limb, we form all cells. Without understanding that, there is no way to understand the cause. Therefore, all patients are frustrated, symptomatically approach treated. Symptom maybe might be temporarily eliminated, but then cause still continue, still taking heavy meat, heavy sugar, etc. Then again come back two years later, three years later, or very shortly. And again in the hospitals, even hospitals while patient in there, they are fed the cause that beef or ice cream or whatever. And this is very ironical situations. And while trying to help sickness, creating more sickness, and endless heavy treatment, more increasing chemotherapy, more radiation, this that needed. And doctors themselves, I know, many doctors are frustrated. Why we should not open the eyes, of course. Without cause, no way of cure. Just remittance, remis, rem, remis, what? remission of symptoms, <laughs> but not cure. But cause is day to day our own way of eating, our own way of lifestyle. And there, probably our thinking, consciousness must change. We want to have the prosperity, we want to have artificial things, we want to have that, etc. So the egocentric, the, our thinking must need to change. But at the same time, we can begin from day-to-day -day life now. And you know, we, we lost family cooking. And all outside fast food and this and that, Etc. And together with we are losing family cooking. We our family relations between father and uh, between father and mother and the children becoming more and more troubles. And also school, the concentration becomes troubles. And the school lunch program is going more fatty food, more uh, heavy food, more sugary food. They can't concentrate in the school. And then, unless we bring back G7 
this America and the entire world influenced by America, good way of eating again, there's no way to solve this. And America and other countries all sinking down. Well, I must tell you that you uh, already had an, an impact on me. I had gone back there to uh, the little room here to eat my potato chips, <laughs> roast beef, <laughs> and, and my Coke, and I could hardly get it down. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, three, yeah. as a matter of fact, I left three fourths of yeah. the bag of potato chips out there. I think I'm going to throw them in the trash. <laughs> let, us, uh, let us think. Uh, let us think our ancestors. Right? Our ancestors means not my, your ancestors, all mankind ancestors. Traditionally, we have been eating whole grains day to day, right? in the either, either bread form or oatmeal form or rice form or whatever, right? uh, pasta and, and then vegetables. Then beans, from bean, bean products getting the more vegetable quality of proteins, right? And some, some country maybe applying seaweed so forth by mineral source. And then uh, we are doing home cooking and animal food like beef, etc. Cons consumption is much, much less. I have no objection to have that, to animal food, but much percentage was less. And not like currently, like antibiotics or hormone treated, like the beef and so forth, right? There, we didn't have cancer in 19th century, 18th centuries. Why now? But tremendous change, the, uh, the diet, and tremendous the crying of the, our what we are eating. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. I didn't know you were a stand-up comedian, but you're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Bigger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Suji, um, your diet seems to be quite the opposite of, of several diets that are popular right now uh, in this country as uh, far as for, losing for weight, example, yeah, like for. the zone diet or sugar busters uh, and those high protein diets, uh, which are high in fat, but uh, yeah. animal and yeah. dairy. But do you think that, that these type of diets then will contribute to greater cancer risks? Uh, to certain period, for certain period, to certain symptoms may be contributing. But what macrobiotic recommending is, very traditional, thousands of years, or maybe million years, mankind experienced, generation to generations, all grain and vegetables, organic vegetables, beans, etc., etc. Right? And that is the base. Then depends on climate. Depends on where you live. Cooking method change, and also combination of vegetables, combination of food change. But the base is there, grain, vegetable base, right? And animal food, you can add 5%, 10%, depends on right, your conditions. Fruits, also you can add, depends on seasons. And suppose we didn't have in Washington, D.C., are in early 20th century banana because simply didn't grow here. <laughs> now we are taking banana every day. Right? Or sugar, we didn't have sugar cane. We are not growing here. Right? All climatic differences there. Right? And therefore, we need those things to have moderation, tropical products, etc. That means environmental consolidation needed. What about the role of exercise, then? The role of exercise. Oh, yeah. Role of exercise is great. However, decently, right? They are recommending that some special exercise is very popular now, right? Certain type of exercises. I would say, yes, you may do so. However, more important thing, day-to-day -day work, day-to-day -day active living. I am recommending to the uh, sick people or people who are sick, and my association is recommending every day with a hot, wet towel squeeze, scrubbing whole, whole bodies, twice morning and night, 
making blood circulation active, so forth. And then take a walk at least half hour, taking a walk, if they can walk. And then uh, if they can do any light exercise, fine, do, but not strenuous exercise. Then every day singing song, happy song. <laughs> United States anthem is okay, right? <laughs> happy song, or you are my sunshine, or whatever, okay? <laughs> and not a depressive song, right? Every day that open the chest and make the blood circulation better and the emotion up. Right? And also I'm recommending like cotton wear, the more skin, more like the bed sheet pillowcase instead of synthetic one. And more also putting that green plant here and there in the home, which omit oxygen, keeping the more house better. And also then this may be <laughs> problem now. Not using much computer and televisions if you are the sick, right? <laughs> because radiation is just coming. Right? It sounds like a whole yeah. positive More reduce, reduce this, right? Yeah. And also the uh, microwave cooking. This is very questionable, microwave cooking. Right? Now 75% of the American family using microwave cooking. This is a big problem, question. And the traditional, more like charcoal cooking or gas stove, etc., much, much better. Right? And furthermore, like electromagnetic environment, uh, better to examine, much less place. And, of, and also home family cooking we recover. And I hope the, they have a chance, a whole family have a chance, some evening dinner time talking to each other. And they sleep. Not midnight, more like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, so forth. And in other words, healthy, normal, healthy life. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mack, I uh, really appreciate your testimony and your uh, uh, presence here after the, the race for the cure last Saturday. And, and it's amazing how across the country that, that this type of, uh, of activity is being conducted. I know in Illinois we had a big uh, uh, event there. I have to say that we didn't have quite the 66,000 people that were, were here in Washington, D.C., but I think that does so much to raise the consciousness uh, of this problem. But in your uh, work with breast cancer survivors, uh, are there characteristics that are um, uh, that you find that people have in common that have are successfully um, overcoming the their their cancers well I will have to speak only for myself and the people I speak to my impression right. of that but I find uh, like mr. Cushy says if you if you have a higher power and you do everything in your on your behalf that you can do uh, to further your recovery, take care of yourself, to find out what's out there, to take care of it. And then what you can't do, let go and let God handle. And also, um, positive. if you can do that, you have the serenity to do the right things for yourself and have that positive attitude. I find that um, through all of these things, we are not we are changing the mindset that cancer is a death knell. And when we continue to do that, we also bring to that good mental health, which also affects your physical health. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Priscilla. Yeah, uh, you've been lovely as always, and we really appreciate your comments, especially the last ones you ma made. I think those are very important about having uh, the higher power, the supreme being, a little prayer doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt a bit. Kind of calms the soul and helps stabilize everything. And uh, Mr. Cushy, I pledge to you every morning I'm going to start singing "You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog" so I can get my body, myself off to the right start. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me thank you both. I think it's been very, very enlightening. We really appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Cushy. Uh, your book, I, I, I'm going to recommend it to a number of my colleagues, and I think they'd like to, yes. to read it as well. So thank you both very much. May I just add one thing that about diagnosis? 
very simple f the family way diagnosis is there about the cancer conditions, the beginning stage. Uh, this place, if green color come out, then we have to suspect in near future cancer may begin. Here? Yeah, that's right. And in the case of breast cancer, this center of the arm, green straight line comes in the case of breast cancer. This begin six months, one year before symptom comes. This, this is meridian, so-called heart governor meridian goes across this breast. That meridian is the crocked, then become green color comes. And in the case of the uterine cancer or ovarian cancer here, the, uh, uh, if we have a very fatty, large uh, deposit, and especially hard one, then uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, and the cervical cancer is very suspected. Prostate. And prostate cancer too, are very suspected. Right here in the chin. Uh, this, this, because head low. This body law, and this is very accurate. And various those simple way of detection available also as a information for the home use. Thank you, doctor, very much. Thank you both. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Our next, uh, and thank you all those who are applauding. I appreciate that as well. Uh, we'd like to now have Dr. Gardner, Ms. Uh, Zariki and Ms. Bedell Logan come forward, please. Beth. Sure, you want to take the chair there and I'll... Uh, I don't know if this is too Ooh. close. Or well, let me, tell me have the, uh, let me have the uh, thing real quick. Let me. Yes. I'm going to testify. Back. So. Okay, good. Oh, sure. Yeah, you, you contact uh, Beth but and we'll set that up. Okay. Uh, Okay, Dr. Gordon, uh, uh, since you have time constraints and you have to leave right away, uh, you said you have a, a re relatively brief statement you'd like to make, uh, so we'll allow you to do that and then we'll go right to our ladies. Sure, I, I wanted to be able to stay around for questions, though, if you'd like to ask the questions, too. So I, I don't have to, I just uh, was saying that I have to be back there by 3 o'clock, so. I, I, in that case, if you wouldn't mind, Dr. Gordon, I think we'll go ahead with this panel and then we'll hold you, because I think we'll be finished by 3 o'clock. Okay, great. Okay, so. Uh, let's start with Ms. Uh, Zariecki. Is that, is that, did I pronounce that correctly? It's Zariecki. Zariecki, I'm sorry. And I was going to say good morning, but it's really good afternoon. Well, these hearings sometimes run yes. a little ways uh, into the afternoon, but they're very, uh, very important. Yes, they are. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding complementary and alternative practices, which I'll call CAM, and the role of women's cancer treatment. I'm Carol Zariecki, an advocate and breast cancer survivor of two years. In my written testimony, CAM protocol. I'll highlight some of these points and summarize my personal approach. I'm speaking for myself and other patients and advocates, whom I'll call we, to request legislation for CAM medical research and funding, rather than to continue regulation of standard allopathic treatments, the costs of which are ultimately borne by the taxpayer and the government, and which do not show an increase in cancer survival statistics. We're tired of hearing about measures such as time to recurrence, tumor regression rate, or time to disease progression when the real issue is preventing cancer in the first place. We would like to see a shift of funding and research attention to the review of a standard cancer protocol that is less toxic, better targeted, and more effective, while at the same time focusing on CAM therapies. The role of insurance coverage as a primary factor in the CAM choice process needs to be addressed, not just for patented drugs or diseases with a name, thereby endorsing insurance coverage, but for natural alternative treatments so that we don't have to invent new names for new types of cancers. We need to have access to treatments and clinical trials that will work with us as individuals rather than be limited in choices. Some toxic medical procedures given routinely can leave the immune system in deep disrepair, 
making one more susceptible to recurring disease for this very reason. Ironically, then, one would have to seek alternative treatment not covered by insurance to alleviate or attempt to alleviate this previously non-existing damage. Information needs to be made available so that individuals are fully informed of options and possible treatment outcomes, including quality of life and survival rates for the treatments they are choosing. Most women given tamoxifen do not need the drug and may even get the dangerous side effects of blood clots in the legs or lungs, uterine cancer, strokes, or heart attacks. A few of these women will have disease progression or recurrence anyway. New legislation is required for alternative therapies in cases where old or even new drugs may not demonstrate an increased survival rate or even a better rate of progression-free survival. There needs to be a recognition of chemicals and the environment and their effect on hormones, from the fish we eat to our plastic bottled drinking water. Our country regularly imports fruits, vegetables, and foods that have been treated by toxic methods, even when the imported food is labeled organic. Since it has been demonstrated that hormonal imbalances are an underlying factor in a growing number of breast and reproductive cancers, wouldn't it make sense to research natural hormones rather than add synthetic tamoxifen, raloxifene, or premarin to an already overloaded hormonal system? Evidence-based testing methods and not just scientific competition within the medical community without regard to the population being studied need to be employed. Trials which indicate life extension should additionally be able to demonstrate that this means for more than a few weeks and should also discuss quality of life issues. Non-toxic and non-invasive methods of cancer detection should be standardized instead of encouraging mammograms which strongly increase a woman's chances of getting breast cancer in her lifetime. Also, for younger women with dense breasts and therefore unidentifiable or undetectable cancers, mammograms can weaken the still growing tissues, thereby promoting future malignancies. A focus on preventive measures which strengthen the immune system rather than early detection methods, which can also be too late detection and with their own set of risks and hazards, can be incorporated into an individual's lifestyle. Allopathic medicine used on its own needs to clinically understand the traumas and abilities it is in itself creating, not curing. We want to be able to live in peace with the treatment decisions we are making without fear that mammograms, therapies, toxic and synthetic drugs are doing a potential future harm to another part of our bodies. We do not want to hear about five or 10 year guidelines that we are being measured against, but rather experience peace by knowing about immune strengthening practices which will eliminate the need for these guidelines and also the topic of recurrence. We are requesting a sharing of both conventional and alternative medicine so that it can truly be called an integrative complementary medical practice. We must try a new approach because the old ways are simply not effective in reducing mortality rates. We must try a new approach because the old ways are simply not saving our best friends' lives. For my personal approach, and upon initial diagnosis, I spoke to my herbalists, each of whom had started their practices due to family members' involvement with cancer. I contacted local and national organizations, including SHARE in New York City, becoming involved in support groups and informational workshops. I spoke with whomever I came in contact with who had gone through a similar experience. I started keeping a daily journal, prayed more, and learned about meditation. I made appointments with alternative naturopaths and noted visualization authors. I began juicing and nutritional therapy, checked out nutritional cleansing, enzyme and vitamin therapies, started ancient Eastern practices of Qigong and Jinsen Jitsu, went to healing services and ceremonies of different cultures, bought more herbal books, and took classes to begin making my own combinations. I became a devout fan of acupuncture and studied homeopathy. I wouldn't say I did anything radically alternative, but then some consider meditation or acupuncture radical. I began to teach others what I was learning about my favorite non-toxic, personally tested alternative methods of healing. I have been blessed with a team of surgeons, oncologists, and alternative practitioners who have come into my life exactly when I needed them and with whom I continue to discuss alternative information and ideas, even though they express doubt about the methods I'm using. There is, I found, a fine line between being cured and being healed. While we all want to think of ourselves as being cured or on the way to finding new cures, the only way this can happen is by allowing a healing to take place on all levels, mind, body, and spirit, and which standard allopathic medicine does not fully address. This is a highly individual process involving reflection and recognition of our relationship with surroundings, why we are here and what we are called here to learn, and then working with this process rather than fighting it or attaching blame. When we approach this awareness, we have already begun to heal, and our own energy, spirit, vital force, chi, and prana are strengthened from within, turning the healing process into a curative journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sorecki. Uh, Dr. Gardner? 
this Can you pull working? the microphone pretty close because so, it's hard to hear sometimes. How about, is that working? That, that sounds great. I wanted to say thank you, uh, Mr. Dan Burton, and uh, also committee members for your role as David in uh, confronting Goliath. Uh, I appreciate and admire your, admire you. Um, I had originally planned to sort of talk about my story and that's not what, what happened. Um, but my story has led me to where, where I am now, the place I am now, and to what, what I have to share with you. Uh, I also um, have an intimate knowledge as a result of my personal uh, odyssey with breast cancer of both conventional and non-conventional approaches. And I, I probably would have just, I, I knew nothing about breast cancer or cancer really, except that people died from it and uh, was frightened by it. Um, but um, ended up really very much using both of them in depth. Um, up front, I want to say two things. I do not think any one approach and any one approach within either of those systems also is right for anyone or for everyone. And um, I have suffered no irreparable harm from any non-conventional approach despite having had extensive exposure to many and I feel that every one of them has helped me in some way, some more than others. And I know I say that because I know that that's a concern that a lot of people have and a reservation they have about supporting the use of conventional therapies or making them available to people. Um, on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, I, I have to say that, um, well, let me preface it by saying that I, I think that conventional physicians, most of them are very well-meaning and uh, competent in what they do. Um, I think they are often more fearful of cancer than the patients, uh, and perhaps it's because they are being expected to cure something that they know they really don't understand. So that can be a very frightening thing, um, and maybe can lead them to be very rigid in the way they treat us as patients. Uh, feeling like we can't have any deviations and we can't waste any time because they're really so very frightened themselves. Um, but basically, in contrast to my experience with non-conventional approaches, I do feel that I have suffered considerable and irreparable harm because of my treatment with conventional methods. And I think most of us have, some of us are more willing to acknowledge it than others uh, because there's kind of a cognitive dissonance there that uh, we want to believe that what we did was the best and that, you know, everything's okay and, and uh, we want to minimize, I think, the price we've paid in many instances. Um, and of course, some people have had less treatment than others. Um, I guess part of my situation, too, is that I did not, I do not feel that if my point of view had been respected, I don't believe I would have ever ended up with the uh, number of very invasive kinds of procedures that I, I did have to undergo and which I continue to suffer the effects. Um, and one of them is lymphedema, which is, no one has mentioned so far, it can be life-threatening because if you have chronic uh, swelling of the limb, there is a rare type of a sarcoma that, uh, which is a very, very uh, lethal kind of cancer that can develop. It is rare, but you know, all of these things are statistics. So um, I guess, 
every day there are people who conventional medicine has sent home to die that are finding their way back to life, you know, even after they have had con been subjected to the, the uh, oftentimes brutal uh, procedures of conventional medicine. I just wish I didn't have to say these things. I really do. I wish that my experiences had been different, and I wish the experiences of many, many of my friends, some of whom I've lost, and some of whom I've seen go through terrible suffering, uh, who have sometimes made it through and survived. Um, I wish I didn't have to say these things and have those perceptions. Um, I wanted to say a lot of things, <laughs> which I'm not going to have time to say. Uh, I guess maybe I can say that um, It's hard, it's hard to, to uh, and I, I know everyone is, is wanting to, to go, and I am too, because I've had a peach to eat today. <laughs> That's it. Um, I guess maybe let me say this. I'm not sure, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't feel, and I, in my experience that I've seen, I, I think we have to find another way to approach cancer than conventional approaches because conventional approaches are based on killing cancer cells. And that does not uh, guarantee in any way that it's going to heal us or keep us alive. And th there are no guarantees made of that. Uh, it's kind of like killing alligators versus draining the swamp. We're not dealing with, with causation. And we're not dealing with healing. And uh, I, I had planned to give you some, some evidence to back up some of that, but we, we won't have time for that. Um, I'll just, in, in ending here, I'll say that um, if anything that you hear today makes a difference to you, or enough of a difference to you, then you know, you'll know you have to do something to make some changes. You'll have to make some choices. And I believe that when we choose, we are not choosing just for ourselves. But we have to keep in mind that we are choosing really now because it is one world. Truly, we're starting to realize that and see that vision, I think, more and more that we're choosing for the human race and for the survival of Earth. And in one sense, both David and Goliath are within us, within each individual. So we have to decide whom we're going to serve, whom we're going to choose to serve. And I do pray that each of us will choose well for the well-being of all of us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, and, and any information that you want to submit for the record, we can enter that into the record, even Thank though you, you haven't had a chance. And maybe during questions and answers, we can cover some of them. Appreciate Ms. Fidel Logan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity. In 1987, um, my sister was diagnosed with a Ewing sarcoma in the calf of her right leg. The protocol for Ewing's is amputation, chemotherapy, and radiation. This was a very aggressive cancer, and thankfully, the physicians found it in time. I remember her fear of being, having her leg amputated at 25 years old. We were in her room when an oncologist came in and said that there was a new experimental treatment for Ewing sarcoma, where they would take a tube and slide it down through her vein, starting at the groin, and drop chemotherapy directly on her tumor. He was told that the likelihood of, she was told that the likelihood of survival would not be changed and that it, way mel it, it very well, well may save her leg. On the strength of this, my sister opted for the new therapy. At the beginning of the fourth treatment that she had, the technician couldn't get the tube down through her groin any longer, and they took her down to sonogram and found a grapefruit-sized tumor right where they had been going down with the, with the tube. 
because of the obstruction of the tumor, my sister developed massive bilateral lymphedema in both legs, which is a swelling of the limbs due to the inability for lymphatic fluid to move in and out of the limb appropriately. This is a very debilitating and very painful process, and because of that pain, the surgeons cut incisions into my sister's thighs and put permanent drains in them to continue to drain the lymphatic fluid. Both of these sites became extremely infected, and my sister was put on large doses of morphine and antibiotics and was dead in four months. After her death, we found out that she had been a guinea pig. They had never done this procedure in this hospital before, and the physicians were not trained to perform the procedure appropriately. We've also found out that the worst thing you can do to a lymphedema patient is cut into them. This was never subjected to randomized control trials, and it's not used today as standard protocol. A month after my sister's death, I started working for Medicare. My goal was to get into the trenches of the healthcare system to find out what makes it tick. I received an excellent education from the federal government and went to work after that for a very large family practice and urgent care center. I've seen the system work from the perspective of the patient, the payer, and the provider. I opened my company, Solutions in Integrative Medicine, 10 years ago. My company provides billing and practice management, consulting, and education services for patients, providers, and insurance companies. We've been at the forefront of a change actively advocating for patients whose insurance companies deny payment for effective but unconventional services. One of the things that I've heard to hear today was talking about the uninsured. For those people who are insured, there's a very big problem with getting coverage for anything outside of opening a flower with a hammer. We have been instrumental in developing the administrative and clinical basis for coverage of a host of integrative therapies, often at greatly reduced cost. But this effort has been very tedious, which makes it difficult to make a large enough impact for global change. One of the problems with research is that the researchers sit in their ivory towers and do research and come up with sometimes very good outcomes for randomized control trials, but we can't implement them at the insurance level, and sometimes it takes 10 years to get a randomized control trial accessible to patients. The U.S. Public Health Service estimates that 70% of the current health care budgets is spent on the treatment of approximately 33 million chronically ill individuals. As the population ages, such conditions will consume an even larger portion of the national health care dollar. With this in mind, my company's vision is to change the perspective of the healthcare industry by providing professional education to insurance carriers, Medicare, physicians, and patient consumers. An example of the education is lymphedema. 20% of all women who have breast cancer, axillary lymph node dissection, mastectomy, will have lymphedema. Those numbers are even higher with men with prostate cancer. These survivors, having now contracted lymphedema, the three consequences of lymphedema are swelling, recurrent infections, and tumor formations called lymphangiosarcoma, which is untreatable. The lymphedema patients who do not receive early intervention may develop elephantiasis, which can lead to amputation of a limb. Prompt treatment by specially trained lymphedema therapists who manually drain the engorged tissue has been shown to save limbs, save lives, and save healthcare dollars. The therapy is called combined decongestive therapy. It has been a standard treatment for Europe in decades. But today, it is considered an experimental therapy in the United States and is not a typically covered service. In the United States, our standard approach is to use expensive pumps that mechanically compress and decompress the affected limb, even though this therapy has been shown to have little benefit. In fact, it can press lymphatic fluid in the wrong direction and lead to a worsening of symptoms. For this reason, mechanical pumps for lymphedema have actually been banned in European countries. In the past two years, we have been able to begin educating the insurance industry about CDT. We have been able to obtain coverage for Medicare patients in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Florida, as well as many commercial insurance beneficiaries all over the country. This type of education and common sense is extremely important when it comes to medicine. Unfortunately, the rest of the public receives conventional treatment, costing insurance companies millions of dollars each year. The treatment of lymphedema is just an example of the education and common sense needed in the insurance industry. The illusion is that best medical practices are based on the result of randomized control trials. It was recently estimated that only 15% of medicine today has been subjected to randomized control trials. It's a sad fact that since there is little to be gained by drug or medical equipment companies from the lymphedema treatment regimen I described earlier, 
little attention or marketing is focused on such common sense therapies. This is why healthcare cannot simply be left to the private sector. Too often the perverse incentives of our system lead to short-term thinking and pharmaceutical band-aids rather than comprehensive chronic disease management. The result, strangely, is poor quality health care at a higher cost. Those who can break out of the system can afford to pay out of pocket. Integrative medicine is becoming rich people's medicine. We must put prevention of chronic illness in the hands of patients, treatment of chronic disease in the hands of integrated medicine teams, and acute and traumatic episodes in the hands of conventional medical providers. I'll say in closing that my my brother died of AIDS in 1994. He was diagnosed in 1980. He was on the television show 48 Hours as one of the longest living AIDS patients in the country. They asked him how he did it, and he said, I stayed away from conventional medicine. I used my conventional medicine doctors to help me decide what, what were the best alternative treatments for me, and did nothing but alternative therapies, and lived 14 years with a very high quality of life, and died of Kaposi's sarcoma. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, that last, uh, uh, not, not the last thing you said, but the second last thing that you talked about was very interesting. You're saying that in Europe, they have been using for lymphedema uh, a different approach. Uh, and it's been done for a good many years, and they've actually outlawed or, or done away with the pumps that are still being used as conventional medicine here in the United States. Uh, That's correct. How do you account for that? Is it, you, you, you mentioned the pharmaceutical companies and some of the companies that produce these things. Do you think it's because of influences of these, uh, these institutions? I do. Um, last, in 1997, which I have the report with me, Medicare spent on the East Coast alone $13 million on pneumatic pumps. Most of those pump, pumps are contraindicated, and the reason why is because when lymphatic fluid is simply pushed from the arm or the leg back into the body, it can create genital lymphedema in men, and it can create um, lymphedema built up in the chest of, of women, which can create lymphangiosarcoma. What these specially trained therapists do, who are trained by the, the Vauder method, which was really born in, in uh, Germany, is they they manually, through a massage technique, open up the passages for the lymphatic fluid to move out of the arm appropriately. Then they bandage the patient with a compression bandage to start the arm or leg from filling back up. Through this process, they are actually teaching the patients to take care of themselves at home. We don't want to have patients keep coming back and coming back for treatment because that's not cost effective. But what we do want to do is make sure that these patients are completely self-sufficient in taking care of their own lymphedema. There's no cure for lymphedema but we can certainly um, minimize, it. minimize it, exactly. So that through massage and through the bandaging. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a very inexpensive treatment, and it usually lasts anywhere between two to four weeks, depending on the severity of the case. Well, now, some women uh, are told by their doctors to wrap their arms or put a casing on their arm every day. Is, are you talking about that as well? That can be helpful with minimal lymphedema, but when lymphedema becomes fibrotic and the limb gets very hard, the compression bandaging doesn't work unless those fibrosis are broken down by, through massage therapy. Through massage therapy. Okay, right. thank you. Uh, Ms. Zer Zeriaki, uh, <clears throat> you were very critical of uh, a lot of the conventional thinking. Uh, I presume you've done a lot of study on this. Well, I, I actually... I mean, how, how did you come to the, all these conclusions that you came to? It's very, very interesting to me. I initially used conventional treatment when I first started out. I wanted to take a chance and explore alternative options. And I was told by a myriad of conventional doctors that I went to that I should Basically, it was okay if I did alternative, and it was okay if I did some herbs and this and that. But if I really wanted to make an impact and to live, I should really go with conventional treatment, and I should not wait. And if I wanted to do alternative, I could always do that later. <laughs> that was the comment that I got. So instead of feeling like I had time to do more research, I felt like I really had to jump in and do the standard treatment. So in a sense, it would have been nice if both of those practices could have worked together. 
as they do in other countries, as they do around the world, um, but not always in this country. From a personal standpoint, how do you account for those in Europe having more advanced treatments or optional treatments and the United States doesn't? I think they are more open to research than we are, and I think that they are putting funding in other areas and, and concentrating it in other areas rather on prevention more so than we are. Mm -hmm. We're using machines for detection when we should be using ourselves and our own inner energies to understand and work with our immune systems. Do you, do you, you don't think that uh, the, the companies that manufacture pharmaceuticals and products are, are exerting any influence here in the United States or you haven't had that experience? Well, I feel that's a large part of it, yes, in terms of the conventional side, sure. It's, it's all tied together. Mm -hmm. But when they start getting the funding and when the smaller alternative organizations don't have a chance and they don't have the money to run any trials, clinical trials, randomized trials, that's, that's what is happening in this country. So that's why we need more funding to go for those sorts of efforts. For alternative therapies? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Gardner, you mentioned that you suffered a great deal because uh, uh, you weren't exposed to or, or aware of conventional or alternative therapies and uh, you, you continue to suffer because of those. Okay. Do you want to elaborate on any of that? Um, Can you pull the mic close? I can't hear you. No, no, that's not what I said. Okay, well, or, I must have misunderstood. Yeah. Um, I said it was not because I, I wasn't aware of them. I became aware of them, but it was because I was not, conventional medicine, first of all, did not respect my uh, right to make choices about myself, mm -hmm. uh, about my own situation. I, it started out, for example, I wanted to have a needle biopsy of the lump, and they wanted to have take it out right away. And I In the went, form of a mastectomy? No, uh, well, they wanted, no, not, not before they did a biopsy, I don't. No, no, not before they did a biopsy. But they, they didn't want to do a needle biopsy. They didn't want to do a needle biopsy. They wanted to just remove the lump. And I wanted to just have a piece of it taken out to see if it might be cancerous. At that point, we had no idea. I was, you know, had, I was in very excellent health. I had never felt better in a sense. And mm -hmm. I've heard other people say that too, just before they're diagnosed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Meek. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I <clears throat> certainly uh, compliment all three of you for your very uh, interesting and uh, informative, provocative uh, testimony. And I know that time doesn't permit me to go into uh, the details of uh, what you have to offer this committee and the Congress. They do have one or two points that I think need clarification. Um, Carol uh, Zariki, on your um, page four of your testimony, you said that you were personally not planning to have uh, mammogram follow-ups and went on to discuss uh, the reasons for um, that conclusion. You heard earlier that there is still overwhelming dependence uh, on mammograms and that it is one of the major educational thrusts that uh, <clears throat> the uh, medical uh, field is uh, promoting and uh, all the people that are into uh, breast cancer are promoting. So I would like to hear some um, amplification on the reasons you have come to your own personal conclusion. Well, I think mainly um, using it as a personal experience, I suffered immense pain and suffering and, and that, that had continued on after a mammogram. And that had nothing to do with just having a mammogram for having your um, breast analyzed. Um, so the, the intense pain and the trauma and that sort of thing, which can lead to a chronic condition, is something that women aren't really made aware of. Um, the other thing is that I think as we know, not all mammograms detect all cancers. So in other words, it's, it, it can be a hit or miss situation. So why should I not subject myself to more immune enhancing procedures such as daily breast massage, which is much more immune enhancing when used with a castor oil and almond oil base 
and protects a person, and we can start our daughters and our, our children and our nieces on these, and it will protect them, it will protect their endocrine, their reproductive systems, and if anything's gonna protect us, we need to strengthen our bodies. And so why tear ourselves apart with machines and biopsies and synthetic drugs when we should be building up our systems? Yes. Speak to that also. Yes, Thank please. Uh, also, uh, we know that mammography is extremely ineffective for young women. And even for myself, I was not that young, but my uh, lump, which you, it was very easy to feel, uh, would not, did not show up on the mammogram. And also, there is, I know of one researcher at the University of North Carolina who, ha who submitted a proposal, and this is an, an excellent researcher, well-published, et cetera, uh, who submitted a proposal to the Department of Defense to have funding uh, for the study subpopulations sub of women who were particularly susceptible to uh, the radiation from mammograms, and there was there is considerable evidence, which was the support for this proposal, to say that there are these subpopulations, which in which it is actually breast cancer is increased when they are subjected to mammograms, and there are alternatives such as thermography, which are completely non-invasive and uh, completely. Uh, Harmless. So <clears throat> what is your uh, comment then on the lowering of the age to 40 years for <coughs> suggested annual plan, mammograms? I don't plan to have any mammograms the rest of my life, and I tell my daughter not to have them, <laughs> and I think they're, they're, they're dangerous and, and potentially very damaging, and I think there are alternatives that are equally or better, more effective. Well, I thank you for those uh, <clears throat> uh, personal comments. I want to uh, add to the record that I was astonished to uh, find that um, uh, nurses in one particular hospital uh, that I'm familiar with all indicated to me that they were not going to take uh, any of the mammograms for precisely the reasons that you have indicated. So it uh, strikes me that uh, we really need to open up the dialogue on this issue and not put such tremendous reliance on this one technique <clears throat> as uh, uh, the way to uh, uh, make sure that we have early diagnosis and early detection of breast cancer. Uh, Mrs. Mack certainly reemphasized your point that notwithstanding the fact that she had had um, the uh, uh, mammogram and other clinical uh, <clears throat> uh, examinations that it was her own self-examination that detected uh, her cancer. So I think there's a great deal <clears throat> in your testimony that um, needs to uh, set our uh, thinking machines back on again uh, in this very, very critical and vital area. Uh, <clears throat> Um, Ms. Bedell Logan, uh, one point that uh, disturbs me, uh, which uh, some of my <coughs> constituents point out to me frequently, is that when they participate in trials or other types of uh, research endeavors, that they are not covered by their insurance, not covered by Medicare, not covered by any health plan, and that they have to um, assume the cost of these trials individually and personally. Is that your uh, personal understanding to what happens in these uh, medical trials? Absolutely. Um, what we have been doing <clears throat> with insurance companies to try to bring randomized control trials that are very positive to a point of coverage and accessibility for patients much sooner than they are right now is by creating relationships with insurance companies at the integrative medicine center level where we treat that particular treatment as a petri dish at that one place. So the insurance company covers that particular service for a period of time and we measure the outcome of a number of patients using that particular service. The patients get reimbursed for what they do, what they get out of those services and we look to see what the long-term outcomes are. But this is, as I said, it's one center at a time, and it's tedious and very slow. But in the big picture, it can take up to 10 years to get 
a randomized control trial accessible to patients, and that's extremely frustrating, and it's frustrating for researchers. A lot of the healthcare dollars that are going towards research, by the time they actually get accessible to patients, there's something better that can be used. So it's really, to a degree, a waste. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. that is really a, uh, a very, very important point that we need to pursue why it is that our health policies established by Congress doesn't recognize the important uh, contributions that these health trials, research trials, are making to the uh, ability of uh, uh, cures and other kinds of uh, processes being developed. And unless they're covered mm -hmm. by the medical uh, insurance plans and health insurance plans, even our own federal insurance plans, or Medicare, Medicaid, mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a real gap in our policy well, why, understanding. Well, why don't I work with you, and maybe we can uh, draft some amendments to some of the health care legislation. I, to, I'd be to, very happy to. I believe let, let, there let is just, a bill pending yeah. somewhere, but well, it needs to really be focused and I'll addressed. Beth, I'll have Beth check on that. But let, let me just say before I yield to my uh, colleague, Ms. Morella, uh, my wife had a, a tumor in her breast uh, for, uh, they estimated, seven to eight years that was not picked up by uh, mammograms. And she picked it up by accident through physical examination. And when she told me about it, I said to her, you really ought to have the doctor check it. She thought it was a fibrous tumor. She went to the uh, doctor and almost walked out of the office without having it checked because she didn't think it was anything. And of course it was, and it was, uh, not only had she had it, it, was, it had spread to her lymph nodes. So uh, they miss about 15% of them, and that's why you cannot look at a mammogram as a panacea, as these ladies have, have, have mentioned. Incidentally, our next panel is going to talk about some alternative machines, I believe, that are being used in Europe through heat that will tell uh, whether or not there's a cancer present, and we ought to take a look at those too. So I hope you'll stick around for the next panel. Ms. Morella? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank the three of you for giving, um, uh, putting a personal face on it and giving us your experiences. And, and as I try to pull this together, um, it seems to me we are saying, first of all, self-examination is probably the best uh, way of diagnosing or noting that there is a problem with breast cancer. I also, uh, and I'm going to let you all comment on, on, on these uh, observations, uh, secondly, that there's not enough research that's being done on alternative therapies. Thirdly, is there a problem that researchers who are doing research on medicine, maybe conventional, the conventional medicine, don't want to share? I mean, do we, do we have a problem of territoriality and, and possessiveness? I mean, should there be some sharing? And then... How do people find out about alternative therapies? Should they just experiment, reading a, read a book? And finally, do you see a role for diet and exercise, as we heard on the previous panel? What kind of a role does, um, does, does that play? I guess that gets you started, and then if I have more time, I'll fire away with some more questions. And I, and I guess you could do it in any order that you want. Uh, well, I'll start out. I'll just say that I think, as you mentioned, speaking. I think sharing is very important. And I've tried to come up to the same, I've come up with the same question between the two communities because I've, in some instances, had to be a go-between and I'd ask my conventional doctor and tell him something that I was doing alternatively that, that an alternative doctor would tell me. And they had worked at the same organization. And I said, well, why don't you two talk? And he said, no, no, why don't you arrange a meeting for us? I don't have time to talk to him. So I would get comments like that. And so my question was, do they really each just want to stay in their own little area of expertise? Or do they really not know about each other's expertise? You know, um, that's, that was my question throughout the whole process. And I, you know, I think it's, it may be half and half. I'm not sure. So I think that's real important in terms of sharing. I mean, it would be wonderful to share all the information together and, and come up with some um, um, better protocol. It could also be difficult for a person to make a determination about what alternative therapy to use, too. Well, when you're first diagnosed, you are kind of hit with everything. And my uh, whole uh, learning in this has been, 
If you want to find something, you will. And so you have to trust yourself. And in a sense, you know, just in the beginning, it's very hard, which obviously a lot of us kind of go to whatever seems to be the appropriate thing, which it is at the time. But eventually you learn about a lot of different things and then you learn specifically what works. And then you learn that there's a lot out there in terms of the alternative field, but it's not necessarily for breast or women's reproductive cancers. And so um, while I see a lot of my friends doing a lot of different things, um, a lot of those things may not be as specific as we can be. And so my, I feel my personal responsibility, and I do that with um, colleagues and friends, and I do that on a personal basis now, um, is to inform them as to what they really need to do, to not to add negative information into their system, be it in the way of uh, a supplement that they may not need or, you know, a lot of different things that are just thrown out there on the market and, and as a marketing tool. And, and diet, you want to comment? Oh, diet is Mr. very Kushi's. important. I, um, I initially started out looking at a few different programs that basically eliminated fat, eliminated meats, eliminated um, dairy, a lot, of, a lot of that. And then I integrated that. I spoke to a few different um, noted practitioners and noted... Um, people who had, you know, successfully gotten rid of cancers. Um, and they all have very positive uh, programs. Uh, what I found worked best for me is not to take just one specific program and say, I'm only going to stick with this program and I'm never going to eat this or that, but to really combine them and to use them all and come up with my own program. And that's what I teach others today. And that, that's I'd like story. to give uh, Dr. Gardner um, and Ms. Bedell Logan, an opportunity to quickly comment on it, too. You asked some great questions, and a lot of them in very quickly. Um, sorry. Um, Self-exam is best. OK, I have to really question that. First of all, uh, early detection is too late. We need to get it way before that. Uh, thermography, actually, if we could start to use that, that, that would actually detect things much before you could even find your own tumor, find your own lump. Uh, in the 1960s, they were doing trials with, uh, and this is a, thermography came out of uh, the space satellite age, Sputnik and all that, and they were using it to be able to sense, uh, well, it, anyway, sorry, <laughs> I get, get off into a tangent there. But uh, basically, um, they were finding a lot of false positives. And so they said, well, this isn't working. We need to uh, find you know, something else. We're getting too many false positives are when you say the person has a problem and they don't. Okay? What they did in a follow-up study of those that they had assessed was that they found that really those people did develop in a, in a significantly higher rate they did develop breast cancer. So this was, in effect, a very early uh, detector of cancer. And those are studies that were being done in conjunction with radiologists. Uh, also, uh, the problem that you said about researchers, uh, n not enough research. I have to say we need not, not more research necessarily, but better research. We need to look at interactions. Right now, we have rigorous trials, but they're very simplistic. And cancer is not simplistic. And I know, in, I know most about breast cancer. And there are tremendous, we need to look at psychosocial factors, diet, environment, exposures, all of that sort of thing. So we need interactions, sophisticated studies. Third thing, researchers don't want to share. Uh, they don't want, many people are not aware that a publicly funded, government funded study, that data that is collected is not available to any other researchers unless those researchers choose to share it with them. And there are precedents now, an increasing number of, of, uh, of research centers who are putting their data on the web. It's called public use databases. And that is something that can help us to break down the uh, really barriers to progress that exist now because of, of political turf issues and wanting results to come out the way you want them to, basically. It's research and it's not science. 
Um, and then the role of diet and exercise, uh, lifestyle is, is critical. Yeah. It takes 30 it's seconds if, if thank that's you. okay. Sure, go ahead. Self-care and diet, in my opinion, only works for those people who really believe they're gonna get cancer and most people don't. So it takes a wake up call to stop eating sugar and fat and all of that. Secondly, the research needs to be more pointed and integrated with complementary alternative medicine so that we get all sides of the research instead of just one. I believe we have a disease in this country called academic constipation, and I think we need a legislative colonic to, to change that. Um, and thirdly, <laughs> thirdly, I think we need to heal the business of healing and really get information out to the public as to what's going on in this country. Legislative colonic, huh? <laughs> well, done. well, you Thank know, you, you hear everything up here after a while. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I as I was sitting here, I was trying to, <clears throat> listening very carefully to uh, the last uh, two responses. And I, I guess when I sit here and I think about this being um, the most powerful country in the world, and we're able to do all kinds of things, and here you are, are here before this Congress of the United States, and we can't solve all problems, but certainly we're here to serve problems and lift up the people of this great country. I was just wondering, and sort of piggyback on what you just answered, but a little bit more specific, um, sometimes I, I do believe that there's a dis disconnect between the public and the Congress. Um, sometimes I think we don't get it, and I speak for all of us. At some point on different issues, we don't get it. And you, have, you all have been kind enough to come here and open your lives to us. And believe it or not, open, it, open your lives to America because C-SPAN is covering this. So this is your moment um, to, I mean, what do you want us to do? What would you like to see us do as the, the folks who represent you, the 435 of us on this side and the 100 on the other in the, in the Senate? I mean, what, what do you want to see us do? And do you think we get it? Ms. Bedell Logan. <clears throat> First, I would like to see the Access to Medical Treatment Act looked at a little more closely. I think it's an extremely important bill. I think it needs some attention. Um, raising the Office of Alternative Medicine to NCAM was an extremely uh, smart move on the part of, of legislation. I think that you're right. There is definitely a disconnect between the people and Congress. So many people just don't know what happens here. And, but they do know what happens at home. And what was very interesting in my personal experience is that my sister, who had a very treatable cancer, was dead in six months. And my brother, who had a terminal illness, was dead in 14 years. We need to get that kind of information out to patients. One of the worst things and one of the best things that has happened recently is the Internet and unfortunately can be a very scary thing to surf the internet about cancer treatments when a patient has no idea what if it is bunk and what if it is actually real. So I think that to a degree, people are getting scared to death, literally. And in order to really change that, we have to start to take conventional medicine and move it into an area that allows patient access to the types of things that will soothe the soul as well as the physical body. And we don't have those things available to us right now. In every single oncology center, there should be an acupuncturist who controls nausea instead of giving people contraindicated medications. There should be a massage therapist in every emergency room to be dealing with migraine headaches. All of these things, we tend to open flowers with a hammer, as I said earlier, and adverse drug reactions are a huge part of that. What I, what I believe that's going to start with is things like the Access to Medical Treatment Act, which I hope is very much supported in this room. Thank you. But would the gentleman yield real briefly? Certainly. Let me just say that uh, I met with uh, Congressman DeFazio this morning. Was it this morning? Yesterday. And we're working to get the Access to Medical Treatment Act in proper form. We'll be contacting all of you. And, and, and if you are so inclined, we'd love to have you as co-sponsors. He'll be the primary sponsor. He's the one that came up with the idea. It's a Democrat uh, sponsor. I will be a co-sponsor. And we'll see if we can't uh, get enough members to move that thing through. Uh, the, uh, I, I am so inclined, Mr. Chairman, and I think that it's, um, just, just to say to you, I think that's, that's a, a wonderful, that 
you know, we can move in a bipartisan manner. I, and that's what I want you all to understand that, you know, you put a face on what we do here. I mean, sometimes things happen, something happens over here, something happens in Iowa, something happens in Baltimore, something happens in Nevada. And all these things are happening. And, and here we have an opportunity. You represent so many people who are in pain. And that's why your testimony here is so very, very important. And we just want you to understand that we hear you. And we, we want to connect. We, we want to get it. And, um, and so I, I, I want to thank you. May I just ask one, one more question? I mean, what, I'd like to, to have um, Ms. Uh, Zaricki. Would you, could you answer that same question? I think the doctor had pretty much answered the last time, and I just. Sure. What would you like to see us do as a Congress? I think most importantly, since in this country, women faced with cancers initially go to conventional doctors and for conventional treatment, I would just like them to be aware of all the options and to let people and let us know as patients what options are out there in terms of other things that they may not be promoting, but at least make us aware of them. And I think that's all we're asking so that we can each make our own choices because it really is an individual process. For so each I, take of us. It, I take it if you don't, and, and if you don't, um, some, somebody, I mean, you hear this all the time, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the statement that the best patient is a well informed patient, the one who goes out there and learns as much about his or her illness and whatever so that they can ask the right questions and I guess do the right things. I guess that's another thing that, that, that the American people have to do. Is that, I mean, would you all agree with that? No? <laughs> I don't really because I've heard many physicians say to me that the informed patients are the ones who cause the most trouble, so to speak. What happens in many cases is that patients come in after reading off the internet about acupuncture and herbs and all of this and their doctors say, we don't know anything about that. That's not efficacious. My sister had a bottle of garlic on her nightstand and the oncologist walked in the room and threw it in the trash and said, we don't want to give you false hopes. Garlic isn't going to help you. That's what we need is a healing between the complementary alternative medicine community and the conventional medicine community so that each one of those sectors of medicine come together and know what the other person is doing. There's nothing more frustrating than a physician than getting caught with his shorts down by not knowing what acupuncture does. And the physicians get very frustrated and they say it doesn't work because they don't understand it. And we need to change our, our medical education, which is a huge part of this process as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, gets $2.7 billion and less than about 1% of that is used on alternative uh, therapy research and I think what we need to do is is is, is get them to realize that uh, there's a strong sentiment in the hinterlands that we have uh, uh, take a hard look at these alternative therapies and maybe more money should be taken from that budget for alternative therapy research as well as conventional research so thank you ladies very very much we really appreciate your testimony uh, we'll now go to our last panel and I think this will be a very enlightening panel as well we have uh, uh, Dr. Edward Trimble with the National Cancer Institute, uh, Daniel Bielan, uh from Apatos, California. I'd never heard of that one before, doctor. And uh, Susan Silver from George Washington University Integrative Medical Center, Medicine Center, and James Gordon, MD, Center for the Mind and Body Medicine out of Washington, D.C. Thank you all for being so patient. Uh, Dr. Gordon uh, has to leave very shortly, so Dr. Gordon, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I appreciate the members who are here. And it's been wonderful listening to the presentations and listening to the dialogue and seeing the composition of these panels, because what we have here is the kind of integration that we're talking about and that you're talking about. We have, on this panel, we have conventional physicians, people who work with complementary and alternative therapies. We have patients and patient advocates and people who are using the healing systems of other cultures. And I think it's exactly this kind of integration that we need in our healthcare system. Uh, I'm a uh, physician. I work here in Washington, D.C. I have a private practice. I also, for the last nine years, I have a 
founded and have led a nonprofit called the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Uh, I was for 10 years before that a research psychiatrist at the National Institute of Mental Health, and I was the first chair of the advisory council to NIH's Office of Alternative Medicine. Uh, I've been interested in therapies other than conventional therapies for uh, 35 years. In fact, I was uh, reminiscing with Michio Kushi that I met him some 35 years ago when I was a medical student at Harvard, and his teacher, George Osawa, had come over to this country and was bringing macrobiotics here. So this is a movement uh, with some history, and I have some history with this movement. I want to focus today on what I hope is one specific answer to some of the questions that are being raised, which is the Comprehensive Cancer Care Conference, Integrating Complementary and Alternative Therapies, that you mentioned when you introduced me at the beginning, which is a conference that was created by the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, but is now co-sponsored by the National Cancer Institute and by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, as well as the University of Texas. And this conference is particularly relevant here. And, and incidentally, I'd like to invite anybody who would like to come to please come to this conference. It's, uh, we're in pre-conference workshops now. The conference begins tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock at the Hyatt Regency in Crystal City. And we welcome everybody, uh, whether or not they can afford the full fee. We have generous scholarships, and no one is ever turned away from any of our activities for, for lack of money. So I want to invite you to participate in this. This conference was, in a very real sense, created to answer some of the questions that have been raised here, and questions that have been raised particularly by women. And the questions are, uh, are there any things other than conventional cancer care that I can use for my treatment, complementary or alternative? Uh, how do I know if any of them work? How do I know if they're safe? How do I integrate them with complementary and alternative care? Who do I find who knows something about these things? How can I inform my oncologist about them? And how can I get them paid for? So we created this conference last year and brought together about 120 presenters from all over the world. This year we have about 130 presenters. And what we're doing is trying to answer these questions in a thoughtful way. We're having people like uh, Michio Kushi, in fact, the study that you heard about on macrobiotic treatment of cancer, an early phase of that study was presented last year. We're having the people who are doing the most interesting work in complementary and alternative therapies present their work to the pillars of the American cancer establishment who are open-minded, who are interested in critiquing the work, interested in creating a dialogue, and interested in developing the most effective kind of cancer care. And I particularly want to acknowledge the National Cancer Institute as well as the National uh, Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And, and Dr. Klausner, who at one of your hearings actually came up to me and said, we love the conference you're doing. Is there anything we can do? And I said, yes, you can co-sponsor it and help support it. And he said, great. And Dr. Wittes, his uh, deputy director who participated with us last year, and Dr. Jeffrey White, who's here, who's uh, been developed a whole series of panels for this year's conference. And, and we hope we'll continue to collaborate with them on this conference in the years ahead. And, and what we've done is both to have the material presented and critiqued at the conference. And if you look through the program, you'll see the whole variety of plenary sessions and panels that are presented. And then we've also put this information, the presentations, together with the critiques up on our website, www dot cmbm dot org www dot cmbm dot org so the information is there I think the kind of information that the last panelists were looking for and that I think everybody with cancer is looking for is let me see the best that's being done around the world not only in the United States but in Germany and China and Japan and South America let me see it presented and let me see some people who really know their stuff scientifically, but who are open-minded, take a look at this literature and tell me what they think, and then let me make up my own mind. Uh, I, I say this con conference began with questions about these therapies for, for cancer, and that those questions were mostly asked by women. And I'm talking, of course, about cancers that women have, but I'm also talking about cancers in other members of the family. 
the Office of Alternative Medicine, 60 to 70 percent of the calls that the office received were about questions about cancer, and most of those calls were from women. In my practice at our center, it's women not only asking about themselves, but asking about their husbands and parents and children. So women are the ones who are doing much of the investigation, and it's their questions we're trying to answer. Um, let me just share with you uh, three broad areas where I think it's very important to, um, to, to make advances and to make changes, and then I'll be happy to answer some questions b before I, I have to leave to go back and give a talk there. The first of all has to, has to do with this issue of sharing knowledge. The, we have knowledge available on our website. The National Cancer Institute is beginning to provide some of that knowledge as well. Uh, we need to make knowledge the best possible information about these complementary and alternative therapies available, just as we need to make the best possible information about conventional therapies available. Uh, secondly, we, or in, as part of that uh, issue of sharing knowledge, uh, I spoke with Dr. Klausner about a year ago, and I want to continue speaking with him about training oncologists, physicians, nurses, oncology nurses to provide this kind of counseling, to provide uh, enough time, enough an emotional support, enough thoughtful guidance, and enough information about complementary and alternative therapies so that each person who comes who has cancer can have that kind of guidance. Uh, this is crucial. It, I think it's a, it's a missing element People often feel pressured into doing one or another kind of therapy. I think there needs to be a time for reflection, and we're very eager at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine to create a training program for these counselors. We do it at our center. We believe it needs to be done at a national level so that every patient with cancer should have this kind of informed, sensitive counselor available for a significant period of time. When I work with people with cancer, I spend about an hour and a half to two hours with them discussing their options, discussing their feelings about both conventional and alternative treatment. This is, so that's number one, knowledge and how to share it. Number two is the creation of healing partnerships. And again, this is a theme that I've heard this morning. This requires that we spend more time with patients, and especially that oncologists spend more time with patients. Um, I, I know a number of oncologists in town. There are oncologists whom every one of my patients loves and loves to go see, and there are oncologists whom they dread seeing. And the characteristics of the ones whom they love to see are that these are generally extremely kind people. They're people who take time. They're people who listen to questions, and they're people who, if they tend to have preconceptions or areas of ignorance, they say, I don't know. I'd really like to find out more or I may be a little prejudiced, maybe you could help me see this more clearly, or who should I talk to? So I think this is crucial that from the side of the practitioners, and of course not just oncologists, all of us who are physicians, I think that we need to share information, and we, this, this needs to be encouraged, that all physicians should be sharing the best possible information about all the treatments they do, whether it's for cancer or any other condition, whether it's conventional, complementary, or alternative. I also think that it's important that we encourage, and in this instance, women particularly. Women have been the leaders in the movement for self-care and in the movement for creating healing partnerships with their physicians. They're the ones who first said, what's going on down there? You tell me. I'm not ignorant. I want to know what's happening. I want to take part in my care. I think we need to encourage this not only at the clinical level, but at the national level. I think it's very important not only the people who are expert in complementary and alternative therapies, but that women like the panelists who are on the last panel be part of the advisory committees to the different institutes and centers at NIH. Finally, or not finally, next to last, coming to the issue of research. Research is crucial, but there need to be new and more imaginative models of research. Uh, coming out of last year's cancer conference, Nicholas Gonzalez uh, presented a very interesting, very promising therapy for the treatment of pancreatic cancer, a comprehensive therapy. And NCI responded and uh, agreed to fund and is funding a clinical trial of this therapy, a very comprehensive alternative therapy, which is being 
funded by NCI and studied by Columbia University. This is the kind of partnership we need. And we need to expand from studying single modalities to looking at comprehensive approaches. And we also need to understand that each person who, come, who has cancer is an individual and that an approach that may work for one may not work for others. And we need to design research to accommodate that individuality. We also need to, to understand uh, and that there is a great deal, and this was brought out in the first panel, that all of us and anyone who has cancer can do on her or his own behalf. And we need to study those therapies and put much more of an emphasis and much more of a financial emphasis on some of those mind-body therapies, changes in attitude, meditation, relaxation, group support, nutrition, exercise, and to really see what is possible for people to do on their own behalf. And finally, I'd like to echo the um, suggestion, and the, uh, I know your strong feeling, that it's time to pass the Access to Medical Treatment Act. It's time to open up um, the arena of treatment to all therapies that are, that are offered by responsible people, and to understand that people can assume that in partnership with a variety of healers' responsibility for their own care. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we, we will push very hard to get that passed, and we'll try to get as many co-sponsors as possible. We're going to have a vote. I'd like to have one more of our witnesses speak. Ms. Silver, would you like to go ahead and speak? And then we'll run and vote, and we'll come right back and try to uh, uh, not have any more unnecessary demands on your time. I, I'm, I'm going to have to go, though. Uh, when you when you break for the vote, so I, I want. Well, I wondered if there. I'm, I'm sorry, I do, but I have to speak at three o'clock in Virginia. That's okay, Dr. Gordon. Uh, I'll probably. I'm going to try to see you tomorrow, anyhow, so we'll talk further. Terrific. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Um, all of us who work in the field of complementary and alternative medicine are grateful for the visibility and the validation that you bring to the field by holding these hearings. The Center for Integrative Medicine is a division of the Medical Faculty Associates of the George Washington University Medical Center. Our program includes research, education, and clinical services. Patient care began in April of 1998, and from the outset, we included a program for patients with cancer. That program is called the Quality of Life Program, and it serves as an adjunct to conventional cancer treatment. We share the committee's interest in research and the current level of knowledge about complementary and alternative medicine and its effectiveness in people with cancer. We have submitted two research proposals to NIH to investigate the use of Reiki and guided imagery by patients with breast cancer and those undergoing radiation. As we all know, research is in its earliest stages. Thanks to the Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at NIH, the pace at which we receive documentation of complementary and alternative medicines effectiveness will increase as researchers are supported in investigating these vital questions. At the Center for Integrative Medicine, we're as anxious as anyone for those results. In the meantime, though, we ask whether we can proceed with unproven, and note that I said unproven rather than disproven, modalities to assist cancer patients. And our answer is a resounding yes. We've asked ourselves this fundamental question. How can we enhance the quality of life of the person as patient? Traditionally, on assuming the role of patient, a person has willingly surrendered quality of life, her sense of orientation and personal control, in exchange for a cure. But we're beginning to suspect that surrender may be self-defeating. Would, we would suggest that successful medical outcomes are diminished when the patient lacks control, information, and support. Conversely, if these inputs are maximized, the patient may recover more quickly and completely and have a higher quality of life, whatever the ultimate outcome. Most cancer patients say that from the moment of their diagnosis, everything in life is changed. A life that was going on routinely is suddenly out of control. The entire focus on the what-ifs of cancer treatment and its outcome. The quality of life program of the Center for Integrative Medicine can assist the patient throughout the course of her illness. At whatever stage of illness the relationship with the center is initiated, we help determine and meet the patient's needs and goals in a comprehensive way. For patients newly diagnosed and awaiting treatment, we offer stress reduction with a focus on personal control and empowerment, immune system enhancement to help combat the disease, relief from symptoms caused by anxiety or depression, such as appetite loss, nausea, or sleeplessness, 
For patients undergoing aggressive curative treatment, we offer relief from side effects of treatment, such as nausea or post-operative pain, immune system enhancement to help maximize the effectiveness of the treatment, relaxation and stress reduction to help restore the mind and body between enervating treatments. For patients in remission, we offer stress reduction during periods of watchful waiting, rebuilding of stamina and flexibility following medical and surgical treatments, and resumption of healthful diet and nutrition with added emphasis on cancer prevention. For patients who experience a relapse, all of the services and objectives of the pretreatment and treatment phase programs can be resumed with even greater intensity. And for patients whose illness is not responsive to curative treatment, we offer control of pain and symptoms of the progressive illness, mobilization of the powers of the mind to maximize quality of life, and reduction of stress to allow for end-of-life planning and resolution. Overall, the Center for Integrative Medicine aims to restore a sense of control and well-being and offer the patient the freedom to heal physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let me offer just two examples of cases in which we are treating women with cancer. The first is a patient with recurrent endometrial cancer. Immediately following surgery, she was referred to our medical center for radiation. And thanks to an active partnership with the Division of Radiation Oncology, the Center for Integrative Medicine was called into the case as the patient came for her initial consultation. Along with vital information about her radiation treatment, the patient was given information about the center and the role of complementary medicine in easing her way through the course of illness. She was given a meditation tape focused on breathing and relaxation exercises that incorporate the details of a radiation experience. In the following weeks, the patient participated in meditation and Reiki and used both skills to reduce stress during treatment and to assist her in sleeping through the night. <clears throat> As the radiation progressed, side effects became extremely bothersome. Stomach and intestinal upset were frequent, but a combination of acupuncture and nutritional guidance got them under control. As the radiation neared completion, the, began, the patient began focusing on the future. She requested further nutrition counseling, both to help restore her energy following treatment, and on a larger scale, sought advice on a diet that would do most to prevent a recurrence of her cancer. And after 28 successive days of radiation therapy, the patient suddenly felt apprehensive about what to do without it. She had grown attached to her radiation team and to the routine of daily radiation appointments. But she found comfort and support in the relationships that she had formed with the providers in the Center for Integrative Medicine. She continues to practice the modalities she had learned and is looking forward to adding yoga to her routine to help build stamina and regain flexibility. She intends to check in with her complementary medicine team indefinitely for encouragement and renewal. The second patient is a young woman with advanced breast cancer. At the time of diagnosis, she was offered several treatment options and chose the most aggressive. She is currently undergoing high-dose chemotherapy. Before her first treatment, the patient learned Reiki and guided imagery. As she faced her initial dose of chemotherapy, she used both modalities actively to reduce her fear and the anticipatory side effects that she experienced. Today, as she continues in treatment, the center's Reiki provider meets her at the oncology clinic and practices Reiki with her as the me medication is administered. Nausea and vomiting seemed inevitable side effects of her treatment, but the patient has found substantial relief with acupuncture. This patient's prognosis is guarded. However, she has expressed confidence in the center's ability to maximize her wellness and comfort. She has learned skills for stress reduction and relaxation that she will utilize throughout her life, and whatever the outcome, feels empowered to maintain control of her life. Let me say again that the Center for Integrative Medicine offers an adjunctive program of care for women with cancer. We are keenly aware of the remarkable advances in oncology through medicine, surgery, and radiation. We are in partnership with the specialists who practice those techniques. But the goal and the value of our program is this. We change the experience of the cancer patient by placing her at the center of care and treating the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. Our patients convince us daily of the benefits that the center offers, but what of the patients we never see? The Center for Integrative Medicine operates on a fee-for-service basis, and our patients rarely have insurance coverage for our treatments. Consequently, our program is accessible only to those with the greatest financial wherewithal. Personally, I find it heartbreaking to tell callers who are filled with hope and sometimes desperation that our services are out of their reach. That is an everyday occurrence. 
I hasten to add that our providers offer a remarkable amount of pro bono care, but the reality remains that to be viable, the center must charge for its services. The issue for payment for complementary and alternative medicine is inextricably linked to research and policy. Only when research demonstrates the efficacy and cost benefit of alternative medicine will it be incorporated into mainstream third-party coverage. We need your leadership to harness the demand of millions of Americans to press for pure science, pilot programs, and demonstration projects that will assess the real value of complementary and alternative medicine. We need mandated benefits that will expand the scope of private and public insurance policies to even the most basic complementary modalities. We need Medicare to act as a model by including alternative medicine in its coverage. The Medical Nutrition Therapy Act of 1999, H.R. 1187, would mandate nutrition counseling as a core benefit of Medicare for the purpose of disease management. That pardon, bill me, pardon me, Ms. Silver. Uh, we have a vote on the floor. Would you mind... Can, uh, I have just about four more sentences. All right. Go ahead. And then we'll um, that bill is languishing pending uh, major reform of, of Medicare. And the bill number on that again is... The House version is uh, 1187, and on the Senate side, it's 660. Okay. Um, as we meet here today, 60 million Americans are utilizing complementary and alternative medicine. A substantial number of them are women with cancer. As the Center for Integrative Medicine treats our small share, we're guided by the principle that wellness during illness is not a contradiction in terms. And again, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to address you today. And in a larger sense, I want to thank you on behalf of those who so urgently need our help. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Uh, Dr. Beal and Dr. Trimble will be back just in just a few minutes. We have one vote on the floor. And uh, I'm anxious to hear from both of you, so we'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs> For your patience. This has been a, a very, very long day, and I'm very, a little disappointed that uh, that what you're going to tell us is probably very, very significant, and we don't didn't have you on earlier in the program. Nevertheless, I can assure you that what you tell us today will be taken to heart and used, and we'll uh, we'll talk to the various agencies about it. So let's start. I guess go down the list with you, Dr. Beeland. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Dr. Dan Bielan, OMD, LAC. I have a doctorate in herbal and oriental medicine and hold a degree in physiology, as I was physiologist of the UCLA Department of Gastroenterology. I'm in private practice in California in European complementary medicine and oriental medicine been working in cooperation with a group of doctors and a radiologist who have been measuring changes in the skin and the nervous system of patients who develop devastating diseases such as cancer and autoimmune disorders. We have found a high correspondence between the nervous system's ability to control metabolism and circulation, also referred to as thermoregulation or heat regulation, and the growth of tumors and other degenerative disorders. In complementary medicine, we try to step back one step and view the patient in terms of the interactions between the internal organs and tissues. Traditional orthodox medicine too often focuses on a single organ of the body, when in reality, many organs are involved in a subtle or not so subtle manner in the advancement of a particular disease state. Yet, when we look at the body as a collection of systems, each interrelated with the others, we can actually begin to search for the cause of illness. Fortunately, I believe that we're approaching a technology which will provide a bird's eye view of the body as a whole, providing information about multiple organ expression and painting a picture of biological processes that may bring us closer to finding the cause of such diseases as breast cancer. That one technology is called regulation thermography. 
developed in Germany and legally marketed in the United States now. Regulation thermography offers a serious addition to the arsenal of physicians evaluating patients at risk of cancer or cancer recurrence. It works by taking temperature measurements of neurologically controlled points on the skin, often above the organ in question, stressing the body with cool air, and then taking a second measurement of the same points. Computer software analyzes the response of the points in their adaptation to the rapid temperature change. More than 25 years of experience has demonstrated a relationship between such responses and organ pathology. The test is non-invasive, painless, and the machine is small enough to fit into a briefcase. Regulation thermography is not intended to be a substitute for mammography or other methods of cancer detection. What it does do is provide information to the practitioner about the environment in the body that could be contributing to the cancer growth, allowing the practitioner to design a treatment strategy utilizing the principles of alternative and complementary medicine, staying within the constraints of good science. I prepared a few slides that better illustrate the theory behind regulation thermography and its contribution to cancer detection and treatment. So if you'll check the monitors. The first slide is the idea of terrain versus tumor. Here we see a large box which represents healthy cells and fluids of the body. The small box represents a tumor which has grown for some reason and has now been diagnosed, say, by a mammogram. Medicine as of 1999, today, has given special attention to the destruction of the tumor, whether by surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation, but has neglected the in internal environment that has contributed to the development of that tumor. Until recently, there have not been scientifically verifiable methods for measuring the factors in that tumor terrain. But this is critical if we're to develop therapeutic approaches aimed at treating the whole patient, not simply mounting a frontal attack on the tumor alone. And the second slide illustrates how we're internally wired, that the internal organs, such as the stomach, pancreas, liver, or prostate, are capable of talking to the nervous system by taking precise measurements of skin temperature as we stress the body, similar to a stress ECG by the cardiologist. We can see how the organs and other tissues of the body behave around that stress. Changes in the way the body behaves to stress can indicate the possible presences of pathologies or pre-pathologies. German and Swiss researchers have gathered data over the last 20 years which have established normal values for stress reactivity in every skin region. Furthermore, many disease states have been documented for their patterns of skin dysfunction over the whole body. Mr. Chairman, this is a method that is objective, reproducible, and bears serious consideration for inclusion into every new complementary medicine hospital and program. It measures the pattern of response to stress, which takes place in the terrain of the body. The information gathered can act as a marker test for lifestyle change, prescription effect, and preventive measures that have the potential to cut the increasing cost of cancer care. In slide three, we see a thermogram above done with this new technology, abo above a normal thermogram and below a chaotic thermogram, you can see how there's a complete disruption of a certain pattern. The top one looking homogeneous, the next looks mixed up, showing a lack of regulation of homeostasis or balance by the organs and nervous system. This is the whole body with data taken from 80 points. In the next slide, this is a study done by Professor Wagner in Germany we see this, that 63 patients on the left bar with confirmed breast cancer by pathology were sent to blind doctors doing a clinical exams alone with mammography added and then with regulation thermography in conjunction with mammography. Interestingly, a higher percentage of tumors were identified using regulation thermography in conjunction with mammography than with mammography alone. This and other studies conducted in Europe demonstrate that dynamic thermography can be a valuable tool in helping to diagnose the presence of occult disease. In fact, some studies suggest that in case, some cases, regulation thermography offers a viable alternative to thermography, to mammography. If proven true, this would particularly be useful in geographic regions lacking mammography facilities or as a preliminary screening device for the family physician. 
In addition, studies suggest that regulation thermography may be able to detect the changes in the body that may preface the development of cancer. With regard to breast cancer and other type of tumors, research indicates that most tumors have taken at least five years from their inception to develop into a viewable size. What has occurred to the body's immune mechanisms during those years, which creates the pre-tumor and then tumor? What do we know about the fertility of our inner soil, if you will, which nourishes or depletes the development of tumor? For these re reasons, I strongly urge consideration for funding for studies in the U.S. On the last slide, of course, breast cancer is not the only disease for which this technology may be utilized. Here's a statistical average of three patients with a progression of PSAs used as a prostate marker and their corresponding thermogram of the prostate points taken by this method. Note the correspondence of a higher PSA, say on the left is 12.53, to the, high, the higher degree of rigidity of response seen in the thermogram are quite evident. And when we see the lowering of the PSA, we see a better thermograph coming out as a result. The point I make is that complementary medicine is not only comprised of non-scientifically based methods. It has in the past been shunned from the mainstream, but the effect has been to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In recent years, Congress has taken important steps to address this issue, primarily through the creation of the Center for Alternative Medicine at the NIH and the provision of increased funding for research in alternative medicine. Many leading teaching hospitals and other medical centers have established programs focused on researching and using alternative and complementary therapies. One of the roles for the Center of Alternative Medicine should be to act to bring these integrative centers together for advanced research on key technologies such as regulation thermography and to provide additional funding for research so that the valuable alternative therapies will assume their proper place within the entire healthcare system. Finally, in closing, I also recognize that Congress this year will be dealing with the critical issue of patient rights with, which, with regard to government-funded and private health care plans. Unfortunately, alternative medicine has been neglected in the coverage decision-making of many health care programs. I ask you, while considering this critical legislation, to keep in mind the proven benefits of alternative medicine and the desires of a significant portion of the American public to have access to such treatment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me here today. I appreciate this wonderful opportunity to share my opinions regarding present fu and present future trends in medicine. I hope we can work together in the future. <clears throat> Dr. Bieland, before we go to Dr. Tremble, uh, I, I hope when we get to the questions and the answers that you'll talk about, I think it was a proton uh, device that uh, can attack uh, prostate cancer. There's uh, a, there's a uh, type. There's a type of uh, hyperthermia okay. that's a local hyperthermia device that's being reviewed right I, now. I want to ask you about that when we get to the questions and answers. Dr. Okay. Trimble, thank you, sir, for being so patient with us today. Uh, Chairman Burton, members of the Committee on Government Reform, thank you for inviting me to represent the National Cancer Institute at this hearing. I'm head of the surgery section at the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis at the NCI. Sitting behind me today is Dr. Jeffrey White, who is director of the NCI's Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. By training, I am an obstetrician gynecologist and gynecologic oncologist, and my own patients include many women with cervical, uterine, ovarian, and breast cancer. My experiences in medicine, as well as my own experience, experiences caring for family members with cancer, have made clear to me the importance of a holistic approach in cancer care. The NCI is committed to fostering the integration of complementary and alternative medicine into modern cancer care. In 1989, we funded key research conducted by Dr. David Spiegel and his colleagues at Stanford and the University of California, which demonstrated that psychosocial support for long survival in women with metastatic brain cancer. Working with the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, We've established a cancer advisory panel for the National Cancer Institute. This panel, which meets three times a year, includes members from the conventional and the CAM re cancer research community. This panel will help advise the NCI's Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine, run by Dr. White, on how best to evaluate CAM therapies and how to develop accurate CAM information for the public. We are also working with the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine and other NIH institutes 
to establish centers for CAM research across the United States. I would like to mention a few examples of the NCI's commitment to complementary and alternative approaches in cancer research. As Chairman Burton mentioned, for many years the NCI has had a program evaluating natural products for anti-cancer activity. One of these products, Taxol, which is found in the bark of the Pacific yew tree, has been shown to improve survival significantly for women with breast and ovarian cancer. We have extended our study of natural products uh, to, uh, from plants to marine products. We are currently evaluating another natural product, shark cartilage, among patients with breast and lung cancer. We have evaluated chronobiology, the delivery of chemotherapy, timed to a person's circadian rhythms in women with uterine cancer. We funded an important study conducted at the Harvard Medical School and published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that new use of alternative medicine was a marker for greater psychosocial distress and worse quality of life in women with newly diagnosed breast cancer. We have started an unconventional innovations program to spur the development of new technology in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. We've heard um, some discussion of the problems of lymphedema today. We have recently opened two phase three trials evo uh, evaluating the safety of sentinel lymph node biopsy in women with breast cancer. If this is proved safe and efficacious, then we will be able to eliminate the need for axillary lymph node dissection and spare these women the risk of lymphedema. We are pleased to co-sponsor the workshop described by Dr. Gordon, which opens tomorrow on, on the integration of complementary and alternative therapy in cancer care. We look forward to continued interaction with the complementary and alternative medicine community in our efforts to improve prevention, screening, early diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life for women with cancer. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Trimble. <clears throat> let, me, let me start with you. You, you. I'm not sure I understood exactly what you just said about the lymph nodes. Is there a, a, a non-invasive way to check the lymph nodes? Is that what you're saying, so you don't have to remove them, so that you would not run the risk of lymphedema? What has been um, shown in smaller studies is that by the use of um, either a, a, um, a, a dye or a radioactive material, one can find the one or two lymph nodes to which the cancer drains. Those lymph nodes are removed and then examined microscopically. And if those lymph nodes are not involved by cancer, then that person does not need a full axillary lymph node dissection. Um, so that, that's, that's the theory uh, that supports our trial in which half the people would get a full lymph node dissection. Well, let, let me just ask you, uh, in some cases they don't take out all the lymph nodes, they just take out some of them. If they take out some of the lymph nodes, don't people have the, run the risk of, uh, of uh, getting uh, uh, lymphedema even though they haven't taken them all? Um, well, the risk of, um, you, you're correct, there is a risk of lymphedema only removing some, but in a, um, let's say, a, a, when a full axillary lymphadenectomy is performed, then 20 to 30 lymph nodes may be removed. Whereas in the new sentinel lymph node procedure, only one or two lymph nodes are, are removed. Right. And, so, and so the incidence of lymphedema following that sentinel node uh, procedure is, is almost nothing. I see. Okay, so, so instead of taking out 20 or 25 and then finding five that, that had cancer cells in them, you would just take out those that you were able to pinpoint through the radiation. Right, that the pinpoint that those are the ones that are closest to the cancer. That's the, where the lymph fluid would drain from that tumor. I see. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Bielan, you and I talked before the meeting, the hearing, and we were talking about other forms of cancer such as prostate cancer and you told me that in Europe they're using a new technology that uh, would eliminate in many cases the need for let's say in prostate cancer the prostate to be removed. You could just attack the cancer in part of the prostate, is that correct? Well I, I, I hesitate to say eliminate the need for because every case is, is individual and uh, I think that we need a lot more research to be done, but the, uh, 
Uh, currently, there's a number of hyperthermia devices. One in particular is made in Spain that is going through FDA review right now to be brought over. And that involves uh, a uh, penetrating radio frequency uh, hyperthermia that heats tissue beneath the surface of the skin that specific uh, uh, could be directed towards tumor. And there have been, uh, uh, there's fairly, there's fair science behind it. And so there's a, a stack of uh, literature that's available uh, privately now because it's being FDA reviewed by the company. That's how, just all how, I know about how it. How long right has now. that been used in Europe? Uh, it's about a uh, six-year-old technology that's uh, now getting to be big in Europe. Uh, if it's six years in, in Europe, they must have records on this. And, yeah, they and do. Yes, they do. Well, does the FDA uh, here in the United States ever solicit those records, or do they just start all over from scratch with uh, with Yeah, that's a very interesting question. My impression with working with the FDA um, that I have done with the regulation thermography is that they look at most cases as new and that they um, do not ask for studies that have been done in foreign countries such as Germany and Switzerland, countries that have the integrity of medicine that we do here, or, or uh, maybe uh, they, they, they're countries that are developed in the Western world just like ours. And I think that there should be some kind of movement to uh, accept or at least be interested in the review of previous research that's been done abroad with such things as uh, diagnostic early screening equipment. Mm. Uh, um, Mrs. Mack, who spoke earlier, she said she did an early detection by palpation by just feeling. Well, the tumor, when it's one centimeter in diameter, is already multi-celled uh, with thousands of cancer cells. That's not really early detection. We're talking about recognizing patterns of disarray in the control of tissue five years before it would be seeable by uh, other methods. So. So um, I think we need a little bit of uh, creative expansion in our paradigm. Okay, well, let, let, me, let me ask you about our paradigm. You, so there's two examples of where the FDA is, is looking at new technologies that have been used in Europe for anywhere from 6 to 10 years. 6 to 15 years. 6 to 15 years. Now, who, who, you're here from the FDA, are you not? Do, do we have anybody here from the FDA today? We don't. You're from the FDA? Could you come up to the table, please? Are you prepared to answer any questions? You're only here to monitor the hearing? Well, I, I, I will give you a, a question. We, we've been told in the last 24 hours of two cases, one involving the instrument involving hypothermia, and uh, the other uh, uh, instrument we're talking about as far as early detection is concerned, even before it's uh, readily apparent through uh, mammography or through uh, uh, physical testing, uh, that these have been used in Europe for 15 years in one case and six years in another, and they have not yet been approved by the FDA, and they could be a real adjunct to our therapies and, and research here in the United States and, 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 and early, de early detection. I would like for you to have the head of the FDA give me a written reason on why these, why they're dragging the feet on these two things. Okay, I'd like to have that as quickly as possible. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if I may add that recently the FDA has made some changes that are uh, actually positive in that they have uh, granted new areas of uh, possible registration of instruments, diagnostics, and treatment that has allowed for marketing approvals more readily than they used to. So at the same time, they may seem uh, slow to acknowledge technologies that have existed with good data. They're also moving in the right direction from what I can tell. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But we still have technologies that could really, really help, at least from every appearance that I've seen. That, uh, that they're still dragging their feet on. And uh, I, I just hate to see any bureaucracy get in the way of progress that's going to help save lives. Ms. Silver, let me just ask you one question, and I'll yield to my colleague. 
Uh, you, you, in your statement, and I'm trying to recall exactly how you put it, but you indicated that if there's new treatments or new things that people could take who have an illness that's very severe, they should be able to go ahead and take it uh, even though there hasn't been approval yet if their life is at risk. Did I, did I understand you correctly? I was referring to the complementary and alternative modalities that we practice in our center. Uh -huh. In other words, those have not been proven by and large, uh -huh. but they've not been disproven. That is to say that no one has suggested or proven that those uh, modalities cause harm or are not efficacious. They've simply not been studied. So for that reason, we ask the question, should we withhold those modalities, knowing, as we do anecdotally, that they can be effective with patients? And your answer and is no. Our answer is we, we don't want to withhold those modalities. And you do go ahead and use them at the We do time. use them. Are you having trouble with FDA because no. you do that? No. These are non-invasive, uh, apart from acupuncture, but the other modalities are non-invasive modalities. Many of them are mind-body techniques uh, that <clears throat> people can use routinely. So there is no... Um, there, there's no oversight, as it were, because these are not drugs and they're not invasive procedures. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to uh, hold out false hope. We don't want to claim that any of these things is effective. We certainly don't claim that we cure cancer. Mm -hmm. We do say, though, that we can change the quality of life of the patient with some of these modalities, and our patients agree that their quality of life has been improved. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some questions? Do you have any Mr. Chairman, I, I, I just want to thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for um, your continuing work in this area and your leadership national, nationally in this area. It's so very important to us in looking at American health and the role of government in helping the American people stay healthy and to help them have access to the resources that help them stay ahead of the fight before the disease catches up with them. I experienced a very difficult um, passing of my own mother through radical, uh, as a result of radical, radical surgery uh, because of cancer. So um, I have uh, strong feelings about this and I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Chairman, and to your witnesses. I think that we in this committee need to to focus as you are doing on helping government get out of the way. You know, first do no harm is not only a good motto for physicians, but also for legislators. And I'm afraid that um, some of our policies that we've implemented have caused harm to the individual and in not being able to take control of their life. And I am concerned that whenever we try to help, we end up interfering and in making the lives of our constituents harder and that is simply unacceptable. Too often access to public treatments is cut off because the federal government is unsure of, of its safety, but to people with terminal or potentially terminal illnesses, this seems to be a cruel joke as it was in the case of my family. I think we need, as you have begun, to seriously question the role of government in relating to certain institutions that may either help or prevent access to um, either new treatments or to education and information that will help us prevent disease. So thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, for, for this uh, hearing. I want to ask Dr. Trimble, um, could you explain to me what circadian rhythms are? Uh, well, circadian rhythms... In relation rhythm. to um, um, a patient receiving chemotherapy. Right. Um, circadian rhythms refer to any of the, the natural rhythms um, in whether that's day and night or, or, the, or the seasons and how they affect um, a person's physiology and, and, their, and their, the functions of their body. In this case, uh, we had some preliminary research um, suggesting that you could decrease the toxicity of chemotherapy if you gave one of the medicines, doxorubicin, at 6 in the morning and the other one uh, cisplatinum at 6 in the evening. And so in a small study, it seemed as though um, there was less damage to the nerves and less damage to the bone marrow if you um, staggered the chemotherapy that way. Um, so they, um, or, or the NCI sponsored a large study in which half the women received their chemotherapy at 
the time that it, at, at any old time, when it, whenever it was ready, prepared by the pharmacy, and the other half got it at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And then they, they looked to see whether there was any difference in the, the toxicity and damage to, to nerves or to bone marrow. Um, and unfortunately, in, in the larger study, there was no difference between the two. Um, but we did think it was an important question, and, and we um, are continuing to look to see if, how we can decrease the toxicity of our therapies. You know, Dr. Trimble, um, American women, and probably women in most of the Western countries, subject themselves to some um, pleasantries, and mammograms, uh, um, pap smears, and we are careful about self-examination for breast cancer with with 14,500 deaths from ovarian cancer though in 1999 I'm deeply concerned that that there's no early detection program for this type of cancer 75 percent of ovarian cancers are not detected until the later stages of disease so I wanted to ask you what is the National Cancer Institute doing to help women be able to detect ovarian cancer before it reaches the critical stages? Well, this is obviously an extremely important area um, that um, we have been working on for some time. Um, current, we are do, making a number of efforts to try to improve screening and early detection of ovarian cancer. Uh, we are funding a very large trial, the PLCO trial, um, involving 73,000 women and 73,000 men. Uh, the women are being, um, half of them are being screened with ultrasound and um, uh, a blood test, CA125 blood test for ovarian cancer. Uh, so that is a test of the best available technology that we have versus standard medical care. We're also trying to develop some new tests. Uh, we have, um, announced an initiative called the Early Detection Research Network uh, to come and which is a an opportunity for us to encourage both laboratory research and clinical research into coming up with new tests for new screening tests for a variety of cancers um, and I know for this particular uh, initiative um, there there are seven laboratories in the United States which specialize in ovarian cancer that have put together an application just to focus on detecting earlier tests in ovarian cancer. In addition, the NCI is committed to funding a uh, what is called a spore, or more uh, potentially more than one spore in ovarian cancer. We have, we have um, this spore, which stands for Special Program of Research Excellence in breast cancer, in colon cancer, prostate cancer, and and uh, and, and it has been a very successful program. It's designed to bring research from the bench to the bedside. Um, and nine centers have applied uh, for that program. Uh, and the, those, those applications will be reviewed at the end of, end of this month. So with, between these three initiatives, we think we're, we are putting a lot of time and tension and money into trying to find a better screen. But you're absolutely right. We need a better screen. Thank you, Dr. Trimble. I see that my time is up. so. But I had some questions for Dr. Byland, and so with the chairman's permission, sure, I'd like I'll, to I'll, submit them in writing. No, you, you can ask the questions. Uh, if you would just yield to me, though, I have a question that I would like to add, and then I'll okay. let you proceed. <clears throat> Are we a yield to me? We're on. Are okay. You? <laughs> Dr. Byland, th th this, this device that uh, they've used in uh, Europe for 15 years uh, that you demonstrated with your slides earlier would it detect something like ovarian cancer in some cases you know you can't um, there's no device that's going to be a hundred percent or even maybe eighty percent but there are cases that have been found when they haven't been found in any other way we send them in we refer them to radiology or to ultrasound and do CA-125 the normal blood tests and so we're able to, to uh, in a small percentage, reveal more than would have normally in other ways been revealed. So it, it, and I presume it's the same for prostate cancer or, or cervical cancer or any other kind of cancer like that? It, there, are, there are more cases found, but it's not a, a, a system that, that in any way uh, could be uh, 
used 100% of the time. That's just not the way to think about these things. The, but it would be a, 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 a good adjunct. It would be a great adjunct, and the cost is very little. The, the machines are costing less than $15,000, which is about a tenth of any of the other medical uh, scanning or, or radiological devices. Dr. Trimble, I, I don't want to put you on the spot or, or the people over at uh, NCI on the spot, but I, I can't understand why at FDA there's new technologies that have been used for 15 years with some modicum of success, a modicum of success in Europe, that have not been approved by FDA that could help you in detecting early cancer in places like what my colleague was just talking about, cervical cancer and, and, and uh, ovarian cancer. It seems to me that the bureaucracy isn't working together and, 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 and it, 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 there's no communication back and forth. I mean, if this has been going on for 15 years, and even if it would only help one-tenth of one percent of the women who have uh, ovarian cancer, it's something that should be looked at. Does your agency ever talk to FDA or look at these things that are going on in Europe and elsewhere? Well, we have uh, very close relations with the FDA, particularly in the areas of um, chemotherapeutic drugs. Um, we have worked closely with them to um, design um, really international systems for monitoring toxicity of drugs and response to uh, chemotherapy. Um, in part so that um, as products are developed in Europe, we might be able to use that data um, to submit it to the FDA for, for approval. So we would not have delays waiting for data to come in on patients in the United States. Have you ever heard of this, 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 kind, this machine before that's been used in Europe? Well, our, uh, um, you know, uh, our focus, or, or you know, I work in the Division of Cancer Treatment, so we have been focused on uh, treatment. Um, we have um, opened several new initiatives in imaging, one of, uh, for unconventional imaging. Uh, we have also recently funded the American College of Radiology um, to set up an imaging network to evaluate um, new imaging in the treatment of um, cancers, and I met yesterday with uh, Dr. Bielan uh, to discuss how uh, this particular technology could be um, integrated into our research portfolio. As well as the other uh, technology he was talking about, the heat, heat uh, device, right. you talked to him about that as well? Uh, no, I did not talk to him about that yesterday, but we'd be happy to talk with him. I, I, I wish you would, because it sounds like it's very promising and it's been used for six years in Europe. and hadn't even been, a, I mean, and, and, and it's not moving very fast through FDA. C can I make a request, and I, if you would write this down, I'd really appreciate it. I'd like to request that the NCI provide a list to our committee of the cancer treatments, including drugs, devices, and other therapies that are available in Europe and Canada that are not available in the United States. And the reason I'm asking for that is because I have a feeling that you you, and I'm sure you're a very dedicated uh, scientist as well as your colleague back there, but I have a feeling because there's so much on your plate right now, a lot of these things that are happening in other parts of the world that may have been going on for some time may not have been really explored. And as a result, some of those things, I know the Europeans are so far behind us it isn't funny, but they may come up with a good idea every once in a while that might help us. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, I can remember after World War II, uh, we were bringing all the uh, uh, rocket scientists over here from Germany, many of whom should have been strung up, to help us with our rocket program because they were so far advanced and so far ahead of us. So they do have some pretty smart people over there. And, and I, I, I'd just like to know if you could give us a list of all these drugs, devices, and other therapies that are available in Canada and Europe, and, and Canada and Europe that are not available here. Because if we get that list, then we can start seeing you know, what, what might be helpful and, and, and then we can talk to you about those. And this is not in any way to denigrate the work you're doing. It's just to say that there might be some adjuncts out there that could be helpful to you. Mr. Chairman, if I might ask the question of Dr. Trimble. Sure. Uh, what's the status of mistletoe? Because mistletoe therapy is being used in uh, many oncology clinics in Europe 
And from what I understand is that our drug companies here are trying to recreate a patentable mistletoe to be used as chemotherapy, but without the original mistletoe, mistletoe therapy, with the research results that they've gotten being acceptable by FDA. But before you answer that question, Dr. Trimble, this is one of the things that really bothers a number of people in Congress, because many people in Congress, including the chairman, myself, suspect that some of the pharmaceutical companies have undue influence at the Food and Drug Administration and some of our national health institutes, institutions. And I hope that's not the case, but we, we, we have that concern. And when we hear things like what he just mentioned, that there is a therapy that's, or, or, or a substance that's being used like mistletoe in Europe to help in areas like chemotherapy, and instead of using that or exploring what Europeans have done, which is very cost effective and inexpensive, we've got the pharmaceutical companies trying to come up with something that's patentable from some synthetic property, some synthetic thing, and the FDA then tests it, runs it through, they get a six or seven or eight or nine year patent, I don't know how long the patents run on those things, so that they can make money. And who suffers? The patients do when there might be something much less expensive that's on the market over in Europe. Those are things that really bother people in this country. Anyhow, go ahead and I'll let you answer. Uh, well, first, I'll take a pass on the mistletoe because I, I do not know anything about it. We will get back to you, um, but that is not an area. Um, okay. That well, that, that, would fall in, that would fall into the category of all the questions I just asked. Yeah. About. No, I can comment, or I would like to comment on their interaction with our um, colleagues in, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, the National Cancer Institute has made a a sincere effort uh, to exchange information uh, with colleagues from around, around the world. We sponsor a meeting in conjunction with the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer every two years to discuss new drug development. Uh, we have um, regular meetings uh, with, our, uh, with colleagues in Japan. We also have been strengthening the ties between our clinical researchers in this country, those in Canada, and those in Europe. Uh, approximately uh, three weeks ago at the, the, the national meeting of the American Society for Clinical Oncology in Atlanta, um, I uh, participated in a meeting uh, to discuss trials in ovarian, cervical, and uterine cancers with representatives from Australia, Scotland, England, Norway, Sweden, uh, Germany, Austria, and Italy. Um, and this is something that um, is happening in uh, many other cancer sites as well. So we are definitely trying to find out what is going on elsewhere around the world mm -hmm. and, um, and make sure that people in the United States have access uh, to the best ideas wherever they're, whatever they're from. Can, can, can I, uh, uh, Dr. White, uh, I understand that you may know something about the the, the question that was asked uh, about mistletoe. I'm just going to ask two more questions, and then I yield back to you. Go ahead, Dr. White. Or Dr. White. Yes, I, I could I can tell you a little bit about what uh, we have done in this area. The uh, as you probably know, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine has. Uh, 10 or I guess now 13 centers that it funds for various uh, different diseases. Uh, it has a cancer center at the University of Texas Houston which we co the NCI co-funds with the uh, NCCAM and that uh, uh, center is actually uh, doing a phase one study of uh, mistletoe uh, in uh, advanced esophageal cancer. Uh, they also have um, done uh, a variety of preclinical uh, studies with other herbal approaches that are used uh, outside the United States predominantly. The, um, as, uh, there are a variety of different uh, preparations of mistletoe that are used um, in Europe and in Australia and various places. Um, and this is using one of those uh, five or six that are available. How, how long has it been used in Europe? Uh, do you know? Um, the, uh, I don't know when it first started. The, the last randomized clinical trial that I'm aware of that was done in Europe was published in 1988. 88? Yes. That's 11 years ago. 
Americans. That's 11 years ago. And we haven't gone through the studies yet on it here in the United States? The, um, well, the, uh, there has not been a study done in the United States that I'm aware of. But the well, review of that material, as I said, has, has been done at the University you, of Texas. You, you know, it, uh, I've had cancer in my family. I've, I've had people up here at this table here who have little children who are dying. And there's alternative therapies available to them. And we run into uh, stone walls with some of the agencies, FDA or others, and, and even doctors who've, who've used some of these therapies they've tried to put out of business. And, and, and when, when we hear of therapies, technologies, or simple products like mistletoe that's being used in Europe with some effectiveness, and people are dying here, and I have to look at these kids and their parents, or, or some men that had, uh, 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 I can't remember, some Hodgkin's disease that was a judge term, was going to be terminally ill, and, 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 and he had to go outside the bounds of what's considered the law in order to be treated. It really boggles your mind and bothers you, and I just can't understand why we're having this kind of a problem. If there's a technology or some substance that can be used in Europe and is being used for 10, I mean, you said 11 years ago they were testing this and using it. Why is it that the United States, the most advanced country in the history of civilization, is 11 years behind, 15 years behind in this other area, six years behind in another area? And when I ask these questions, they say, of the FDA, this young lady that's sitting back there, she says, well, we'll check on it and get back to you. But there really isn't any answer. I just don't understand it. And, and it seems to me that Dr. Trimble and, and you, Dr. White, and others ought to be constantly looking at these alternative therapies along with the Food and Drug Administration to try to make sure that we're giving the American consumer, the American patient, the very best opportunity to live a healthy life and to survive if they're in big trouble. And I know you're trying to do that, but it seems to me that some, someplace the golf club's missing the ball. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I asked that question of uh, Dr. Trimble, that uh, we, we get a list of all the uh, cancer treatments they're using in Canada and, 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 uh, and uh, Europe uh, and the devices and the other therapies so that we can at least look at them and see what the heck's going on over there that we're not doing. It's really frustrating to me when I hear this kind of stuff. Go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to um, put a little bit perspective on the mistletoe issue. I understand the broader scope of what it is that you're saying, but specifically on mistletoe, uh, the, the largest clinical trial that I'm aware of um, was a randomized trial with three arms on it, one, one arm that uh, patients did not receive any uh, supplemental care after their surgery. This is for breast cancer. Another arm received uh, standard chemotherapy at plus or minus radiation therapy for their, for their breast cancer. Uh, this is all adjuvant therapy. And the third arm received uh, mistletoe. Uh, both of the, uh, the, the mistletoe arm did better than no therapy, but the chemotherapy arm did better than no therapy. And the mistletoe arm did no better than uh, chemotherapy, actually. Uh, so I think it's, it's not, and so we're talking about, first of all, adjuvant therapy. So this is uh, not in advanced forms of cancer. And secondly, uh, it, it is not something that represented in, in that study a step above what was already available to the patients. Dr. Breeden? Uh, if I may comment that there are stati statistics being gathered by uh, an immunologist and oncologist colleague uh, in Austria for the Germanic countries, and they've discovered the statistics seem to be coming out that using um, chemo plus uh, complementary therapies such as mistletoe together resulting like in in breast cancer the number is 25 percent less recurrence rates when you use the both together so i think that those kind of statistics need to kind of leak over here so that we can begin to take the best and to integrate them and add them together to have an additive effect and that same statistic came out for prostate and melanoma is that published information I believe so. It's in. Oh. I, I can lead you I'd to I'd be it. happy to, to, to review that. Well, see, this is the kind of communication that every American likes to see all the time, not just at the table here at a hearing. And so uh, let me just ask two more questions, and I'll yield to my colleague, and then we'll wrap this up because we've all been here a long, long time. 
the NCI gets $2.7 billion, $2.7 billion for cancer research. You're spending less than 1% of that on alternative therapies. We're hearing things here today that indicate that there are some alternative therapies with promise. And I'm sure you're going to give me a list of other things that have promise that we're going to get from Europe. Why is it that we only spend $20 million out of $2.7 billion on alternative therapies when half of the Americans who have problems are using and trying to find alternative therapies? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Can you give me an answer to that, Dr. Tremble? Why are we only spending $20, 20 million? Well, as uh, I know that, um, Mr. Chairman, that you have had some discussions with my director, Dr. Klausner, on this issue. Um, we realize that we need to provide the American public with um, accurate information on complementary and alternative medicine, and we need to provide them with uh, accurate appraisal of uh, these techniques in terms of whether they work uh, so that um, people of the United States can uh, decide for themselves whether they um, wish to avail themselves of various complementary and alternative medicine techniques. Uh, we well, I, are, think you, I think you're making my point. We need to spend more money than just one, well, less than 1 percent on that. Wouldn't you agree with that? Well, I agree that we need to uh, do more research. And to that end, we have agreed to co-fund with the other institutes uh, centers for alternative medicine research across the United States. We are actively soliciting uh, new ideas that we can uh, test at these centers and through uh, with their um, existing cancer centers. Uh, and so we hope that we can make more information available and have more um, and better treatment, which combine standard treatment, complementary medicine, and alternative medicine for the people of the United States. Let me yield to my colleague. She has to uh, leave. Dr. Trimble, could you commit to us how much the National Cancer Institute will um, dedicate to alternative medicine studies and uh, results? No, I, I, th that's uh, above my, uh, my pay level to make that kind of uh, a commitment. I will commit that we are actively recruiting um, studies. We, we have committed to setting up uh, centers uh, to study complementary and alternative medicine. Um, and we will continue um, to, to forge a joint approach uh, with our colleagues in other medical disciplines to, um, in this area. Um, Mr. Chairman, I wonder, as a member of your committee, if, if I might ask that you would ask whoever is in the proper pay Dr. grade. Dr. Klausner. Dr. Klausner. Mm -hmm. How much? I, I'd like to know as a congressman I, how I much I think what be. we ought to do is, is, as a Congress, take a look at the amount of money we're appropriating for NCI and uh, talk to the people in the Appropriations Committee. And maybe since NCI, of their own volition, isn't going to authorize more money for alternative therapies, maybe we should just specify in the appropriation bill how much you have to spend for that. And if we did that, maybe that would, that would break the logjam. But I'll try to talk to Dr. Clausen. I want you to make an oath, Beth, that we, we do that. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I just, I just wanted to share on the record with you an observation um, that I've made. Um, you know, we, we broke all the barriers down when we passed NAFTA and GATT. Now we have the World Trade Organization. And we're importing 22% of our beef that comes from foreign countries, and we don't know where. And they're, they have certainly different standards than we have, and yet we're consuming that beef not knowing that it's coming from foreign countries. 40% of our lamb sometimes comes from uh, 7,000 miles away. We don't seem to ask a question about that. We, you know, we have toys that come from China, and we have Hot Wheels that come from Malaysia, and we have dog bones that come from Argentina. Nobody seems to worry about that in this whole global economy. But what about getting information from Europe that we can use on a par, the studies, and, and benefit from them? Um, it just seems absolutely incredible to me that we always have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to medicine. And yet in every other arena uh, in this global economy but medicine and freedom 
from medicine and freedom from the institutions of the individual sometimes when we make that choice is what's sorely lacking. I'm afraid this Congress, unfortunately, is supporting the institutions and the patients have become a byproduct or um, just a necessary uh, function for the institutions instead of the institutions being a necessary function to better health care. So, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would love to work with you on perhaps requiring uh, something in NAFTA um, or GATT that would um, mandate that these studies be accepted by FDA on a par. Uh, we'll take a look at it. I'll get together with you and we'll have Beth uh, look into it and see if we can't maybe uh, uh, do some of that. I, Thank I you. think that uh, uh, at the very least those technologies should not languish for six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen years before they're utilized here in the United States. I was just informed that shark cartilage, for instance, uh, I think Dr. Trimble said they're testing that. Seven years ago they started talking about it and we're just now doing it. So, you know, it, uh, it, it, it seems like there is a a lot of foot dragging. Well, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you, Mr. White. You weren't scheduled to speak, but we do appreciate your coming before us. Uh, Dr. Trimble, Dr. Breland, thank you very much. Ms. Silver, thank you very much. And I want to thank you once again for your patience. We stand adjourned. a meeting of the United Nations Security Council and their discussion of the Kosovo Agreement. And live at 9, today's NATO brief.